Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I'm Floyd Davenport. I'm the director of IT here at Washburn University. It's great to see everybody here for Check 2016. And really, to kick off our conference today, uh, Dr. Jerry Farley, our president, president of Washburn University, has come over to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Any particular words you'd like to hear? I mean, a, a few, a few words, right? Welcome. Welcome to our campus. I'm sure several of you have been on this campus before. Uh, we, just as you are, are very proud of our campus. and We think that it is a beautiful place and sort of a, a welcome respite here in the city being all around us. And so we're, we're pretty proud of the campus. I urge you to, uh, to go out and take a stroll. It's very peaceful, very, uh, uh, very contemplative environment here. But that's a far cry from what you guys do. All you folks are in environments which are high anxiety sometimes, uh, uh, things that are always happening, new changes, things that, uh, things that do well and go well and things that maybe not so much. And for many of us, uh, particularly ones dressed like me, I see I'm the only one here dressed like me, uh, uh, you, you, you know what you're doing. And those dressed like me, we don't know what you're doing. And it makes it very difficult. Um, I've been responsible over the years for um, IT in a number of different venues. And it's always been exciting and fun, but really complex. It is something that most of us mortals don't really grasp what you do. But you have to, at some point, release us. You know, you've got to educate us enough that we can take that next step. Um, I, I live not far from here and have a little balcony at the house in which we live. And I noticed several weeks ago, a month or so ago, that um, a bird had built a nest on that, back, on that balcony. And so I'm gonna go out and throw it away. And I look at the nest, and it's, a, it's perfectly constructed. I mean, it is absolutely a spherical little thing built in a little bowl, and it was just spectacular, smooth inside. The next day, there were four little blue eggs in it, little tiny blue eggs in it. And then there was the mother bird. They came and sat on those eggs and did it every day, every night, all the time, keeping them warm. And eventually, she helped peck on the egg and release the little bird that's in there. And then she started feeding them. And when she would come from a foray across the lawn looking for food, all those, there were four of these little birds and they all had their mouths open, you know, looking up at her mouths, big mouths too, okay? And she would feed them. And they began to grow, they developed feathers, she was still feeding them, taking care of them. And two days ago, they started moving out of that little nest and they would get on the edge. And this was a balcony, it's a couple of stories up. And she would kind of nudge them along and finally pushed one of them off. And it flew. It knew how to fly. And then the other ones would go and the other ones would go. And now they're all gone. And this morning when I was thinking about coming over here, that story made me think of me and you. You're the mother bird taking care of all of us that got our little hungry mouths open. We want something from you. And we're not sure exactly what or why, but we need something from you. And we know we can't get along without you. But we're a little bit frightened that you're going to push us over the edge and see if we can fly. <laughs> And that creates a little anxiety on our part. So be gentle with us. Uh, recognize that we don't know what we probably should know, and certainly to the depth that we should know it. And you will, at this conference, as with many other continuing education conferences that you attend, you're going to learn the newest and the latest. You're going to learn what 
will work in your environment and what may not work in your environment. You're ready to test things. You're ready to do something that's new and different. And that's a little frightening for your campuses, a little frightening for some of your administrators on campus because, again, they don't understand all of that. And I hope that as you're sitting around the tables today, as long as when you're walking across the campus, when you're at the burger stand tonight, you'll think about us poor mortals and think about how you might make our lives a little bit easier. And if you come up with a good way of doing that, come work here at Washburn. I need the help. We're delighted to be able to host you here on campus. I know it's going to be a great meeting for you. It's going to be a fun time to renew acquaintances. And it's a welcome respite for you to be away from the campus a, a while, I, I imagine, because you probably have heard that there's a little financial trauma in the state of Kansas. Recognize that you're only about a half a mile from the epicenter of that. But maybe you will have a little time while you're here to reflect on things that are maybe a little more positive than the financial situation. But you watch. We will survive. We will persist. We will make it through this difficult time. And the students that come a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, they will be arriving at the best of times on your campus. All of this will be a memory. And it's not part of their memory. You can make all of that better, and you can make it happen. I encourage you to continue your involvement in education sessions like this, and that you will take these things that you learn here back to your campus and make life just a little bit better for everyone there. Thanks for being here. We welcome you to our campus. Good day. Thanks, Dr. Farley. Okay, before we get started with our keynote presentation, unfortunately not everything goes as planned and so I have some housekeeping and some corrections to make, so bear with me because I had to make a list. First of all, before we get started with the conference, I want to give a shout out to our 18 sponsors for the conference. While the conference is all about us, the sponsors help make that happen. So uh, please take some time over the next day they're right outside these doors to your right. Take some time and go visit with them. They're all ready and set up to show some of their services. This thing is right in my face. Some of their services and uh, new products and uh, we're very happy to have them here. The gold sponsors are right out in the hallway here to your right and they're listed right here on the screen. And our silver sponsors are in the room next door. Hopefully some of you have already been over there to check it out, but please take some time and visit with them. Uh, in that room next door, the, the sponsor room, throughout the next 24 hours, we will have treats and snacks, and that's where they'll be located. So if you're feeling a little hungry or you need something to drink, uh, feel free again to go to the sponsor room, the silver sponsor room next door, and uh, have something to eat and take advantage and take some time and visit with them. They've got a lot of fun technology over there. I've been over there right now. They've got a couple of gadget tables that are very intriguing. Uh, tonight we have an event planned at the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, the KBI building that's hosted here on the Washburn University campus. It's right to the east. And somewhere after all the sessions tonight, uh, we're going to walk over to KBI and we're going to have some food and some snacks over there and we're going to do tours. So they're going to take you through the Kansas Bureau of Investigation side and tell you what they do. And we also have a Washburn side of that building where we have four programs, anthropology, chemistry, biology, and computer science. They have programs over there, and they're going to tour you uh, some really neat facilities and tell you about their program. So I hope you all join us tonight. And if the weather cooperates, it'll make it a lot easier for us just to walk over. Campus isn't too big. It's only about a five-minute walk. If the weather doesn't cooperate, I'm assuming a lot of you parked right out over here in the larger parking lots. There's lots of parking over at the KBI building on the east side of campus, and if the weather doesn't cooperate, we may take some time and try to move everybody over there. So we're going to have food here, snacks throughout the day. We're going to have snacks at the KBI in the atrium there as we have our tours. And then that's going to start around 5.30, right after we get done with uh, our sessions here today. And then that's going to last to about 6.30 or 7 with the tours. And around 6.30, right down the street at the hamburger stand, we're going to have 
uh, a social event as well. So if you want to take some more time and get to know people and visit and share your stories and your successes and visit with vendors and our sponsors, you can do that tonight. That'll start around 6.30. Um, don't let the name fool you. They have really awesome hamburgers, but they have a, a wide variety of beers and sodas and wine. And if you look in your name tag, on the back you should find a little red ticket. And that red ticket will give you one free soda or one free beer or one free glass of wine at uh, the hamburger stand tonight. So it might be a little cozy, but we'll have a lot of fun. So I hope you join us there as well. Let's see, what am I forgetting? Okay, we have this room. As you can see in the back here, we are streaming all the presentations, including our keynote presentation this afternoon, uh, online through YouTube, and we're going to record these sessions. So that's something new, and it'll be really great. Uh, it's our um, approach to making sure that all the folks that couldn't come and attend the conference in person have an opportunity to participate remotely. And these guys do an awesome job, so I'm sure the stream is looking really good, and I'm excited about that. So we have sessions in this room, this is Washburn A, and then we have three rooms upstairs, and there are signs and people that will help you get to where you need to go uh, throughout the day, uh, and that should be uh, pretty straightforward. I think they're easy to find. If you do have questions throughout the day, if you see anyone, usually with a Washburn shirt on that has a badge that has a little green uh, ribbon on it, those people are there to help you out. So if you're having some problems, can't find somewhere where you need to be, need some help with some technology, uh, seek one of those individuals out or go to the registration desk and we'll make sure that we get you some help. We are uh, not only streaming the event, but we are uh, putting things online. We have a Twitter feed. So if you want to follow Twitter and see all the comments and participate in that, that social media throughout the event, uh, on Twitter, it's at CheckConf, C-O-N-F, correct? Somebody nod, yes, thank you. And if you want to uh, participate in the conversation on Twitter, you can do that by tweeting with the hashtag Check2016, Check2016. And that will get that in that Twitter feed. And if you have pictures, we're going to be taking some pictures, I think. We're going to be taking some pictures throughout the event to share them with everyone that's participating and those who can attend. And if you want to uh, participate in that and take a picture and share it, all you have to do is send that picture to check at washburn.edu. So check at washburn.edu, and that'll put it all, automatically put it in Flickr, if I'm correct. So we're doing that as well. Um, let's see. Tomorrow, after the sessions, we're going to have a buffet-style lunch. It's going to be held in this room. The buffet will be set up right outside these doors, and we hope you stay for lunch and participate. And what we thought we would do is we would have a birds of feather type of model. So tomorrow, when you come in for lunch, we're going to put little signs on some, uh, some of the tables here for different subject matter, where you can sit down with your colleagues from across the state and visit about different topics. And if you have a topic that you would like to uh, suggest for one of the tables here, feel free to do so. All you have to do is go to the registration desk, let them know that you would like to suggest a topic for lunch tomorrow for the, uh, uh, for the birds of a feather, and they'll take down your suggestions, and we'll try to include that as well. Uh, there's been a couple of questions whether there might be a tour uh, for the IT side, if people are interested in seeing our data center here. In fact, our, we just went through a power upgrade this weekend. We brought our entire data center down, replaced the power and the UPS, and then brought it all back up. And I think there was a number of people who spent almost, I don't know, about a 14-hour day and about an 18-hour day going through that process this weekend. So if you see someone blurry-eyed, that's probably one of them here at Washburn. Uh, but they did a great job and we're back up and if you're interested in seeing that since there's been some requests after lunch tomorrow at one o'clock if you want to ride around outside these doors if anybody's interested we'll get a group and we'll take you over and show you a little bit about some of the upgrades maybe the renovation walk you through uh, morgan hall which we did a big uh, renovation this year and then we'll walk you through our data center i have a couple of corrections to make i have to find them uh, on our booklet, everybody has a booklet in their bag. 
Uh, today at 3.30 in the Kansas room, it's not listed correctly. You can see that there might have been some cut and pasting going on when we put the booklet together. So uh, today at 3.30 in the Kansas room, where there's a session by Kansas State University on centralizing and simplifying application management and Windows. So uh, that's a session that should be listed in the booklet but isn't, and that's at 3.30 in the Kansas room today. Also, we missed one of our silver sponsors in the booklet. Uh, Kansas City Audio and Visual was uh, not listed in the booklet as well. So again, we want to include them and thank them for their participation in the conference today and tomorrow. Lastly, uh, just a quick thank you. I want to thank everyone who has helped put the conference together. I don't know if I'll get another opportunity as those who have already hosted this conference know and as Florida our Fort Hayes, Fort Hayes will learn next year. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of work. So personally, I want to thank the folks on my staff that participated in putting this together. I want to thank the, um, I got to read this here, the Information Technology Services Advisory Group, uh, ITSA, as we fondly call it. And I don't know if there's anybody from ITSA. I know John. Yeah, stand up if you're in ITSA. You help put this conference together, and we want to thank them for all the work that they do and the selection process that goes into getting all the sessions together. So thank you. And, and I'm, I'll single out John Haverty. He's hiding in the back over there. John uh, works here at Washburn. He's part of ITSA, and he coordinated and managed pulling all this together. And uh, thanks, John. It was, uh, you did a great job. Okay, so let's move to our keynote presentation today. We're going to talk about elevating security awareness in higher education. Ben McGuire has traveled all the way from Washington, D.C. to be with us today. He's from EAB. Uh, we've been a member of EAB for two years in the IT forum. We're also a member in the business forum here at Washburn University. I'll let Ben tell you a little bit about EAB and what they do. Um, the only thing I would add at this point is I've, been, I've seen their presentations before and they pack a lot of information in them and they move pretty quick. So for that purpose, if you look in the center of your table, you will see a handout of their presentation, of Ben's presentation today. That's going to help a lot. I encourage you to use that to follow along, take notes, uh, or uh, take it with you so that you have information. It's really good information. That's one reason we invited EAB to come and share information with us. So with that, I'm going to turn over the microphone to Ben. Welcome, and uh, uh, welcome everybody, and we'll get uh, Check 2016 started. Can anyone hear me? There we go. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I can stand back here. <laughs> can I turn off this mic? Have we turned off the mic here? Yeah. Okay, try it again. Right. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, thank you to Floyd and to Washburn University and for all of you for letting me participate today. Um, driving in from the airport, driving through Kansas, uh, you can't help but see how passionate and vibrant higher education is in this state, in road signs, and billboards, in hats, and clothes, everywhere you go, uh, the universities and colleges um, that are in this room are really a huge part of the culture here. So it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be able to join you for this. Uh, before I get started, I want to give you a little bit of context into um, EAB and to uh, what we do uh, to give you some uh, perspective into why the presentation will look the way it will. And EAB, or the Education Advisory Board, is a higher education research group in Washington, D.C., as Floyd mentioned. Um, we were launched in 2007, and today we work with about 1,000 colleges and universities across North America and across the world. Um, to put that number into context, about 75-80% of undergrads in the United States actually attended one of our member institutions last fall. So we cover a lot of the education space within the United States. 
And what we do um, comes in a few distinct flavors. Uh, our core business is research and insights. We have forums dedicated to the up at night challenges of university executives across different areas. Um, I'm here on behalf of the IT forum, um, but we also have a forum for provosts and academic affairs, for uh, COE and continuing online education, um, university systems forum, facilities forum, et cetera. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of work and investment in technology, uh, specifically in student success. I know some of the institutions in the room will likely have heard of SSC, SSC Campus, SSC Guide. Um, we also do work in data and analytics and in managed services through enrollment as well as advancement. Um, and I've thrown up a few of our current members on the slide. This is just to, to give you a sense. We really work across the spectrum of higher education, um, from community colleges, small, small baccalaureate schools, all the way up to the largest research institutions. And as I mentioned, what we do is work with university executives and their teams on their largest up at night challenges. I'm here with the IT forum, and so we provide research and advice for CIOs, IT teams, um, helping them manage the technology that is um, familiar in many industries in the higher education space, which is unique and probably uniquely difficult. And when I say best practice research, I mean something uh, fairly particular. Um, what we do is ask our members to tell us what their biggest challenges are. What are your upper night issues? What are the strategic challenges that you've been facing year after year that continue to be tough? Um, and where you feel that change is really an urgent priority right now. Uh, we'll boil the ocean as much as we can, try to find everything that's going on inside, outside of industry, narrow it down to a few hundred, then a few dozen practices that we think are innovative, that are effective, and give our members um, the 12 to 30 practices that we think are newsworthy, that are replicable across different kinds of institutions, and that can really drive change on campus. It's not uncommon, actually, for um, one of our forum meetings to have an institution set just as diverse as the one in this room, research titans alongside very, very small schools, and we want to make sure that the practices we bring to the space um, can be effective for all of those kinds of institutions. And I give you that, uh, that brief background uh, to set up why we ended up tackling education, uh, higher ed, security, awareness. And our, it's because, and this probably won't surprise many of you, um, security is making a lot of headlines and it's becoming a bigger and bigger priority for IT leaders and for their teams. Uh, security breaches are now making news, mainstream news, in a way that they never have before for higher education. Um, you have more high-profile incidents. I would be shocked if all of you hadn't heard of the University of Maryland in 2014, uh, but there's a lot of small schools that fall into this list, a lot of very large institutions that fall onto this list. Um, and these can be incredibly expensive. When a few journalists tabulated the costs of the promised remediation after the University of Maryland's breach, it looked like about 2.6 million in uh, credit monitoring and close to 20 million if you added up all the promised changes and reforms to the security infrastructure. We're seeing more and more of our members take this seriously, hiring chief information security officers or CISOs, uh, reforming security governance, um, governance risk and, and compliance across the university. And we're also seeing a lot more board attention, a lot more strategic thinking about security. Uh, this is some interesting survey data that was released fairly recently. They asked security experts in different fields um, if they briefed the board of directors at their organization on security. And today you can see about one in five uh, CISOs or heads of security within an organization is actually briefing the board of directors on cybersecurity strategy. Within three years, they expect that to be more like two in three. Um, so we have a dramatic shift, or we expect a dramatic shift, in how organizations are treating security. And it's not hard to see why uh, we think that small to medium breaches, as you will often hear, are really a question of when, not a question of if. Um, the data on this slide is from a survey of CISOs from around the world within different industries. And I'll walk you through it briefly. On the y-axis, you have the likelihood of a, a breach event within the next two years, the assumed likelihood. On the x-axis, the number of records that could potentially be exposed. The line that's drawn through the center of the page is where those guesses coalesced, where they averaged out. And I'll start with the good news over on the far right side of the page. Uh, the chance of a very large event, a Maryland-style breach, uh, still is thought to be very low. Uh, we think that this is going to continue to be relatively rare for institutions. Um, pretty large incidents, 50,000 records or more, are slightly more likely. Where I want to really focus your attention is on the top left where minor breaches, 10,000 records or less. Um, security experts think that for a given organization, uh, 
uh, you're likely to see a one in five, one in four chance of a breach of that size within the next two years. The question is, why does this matter so much for higher education? After all, we don't necessarily have a lot of the very valuable data that financial firms are worried about. We don't have always the HIPAA data that healthcare organizations are worried about. Where we see the challenge is that higher ed tends to be seen as a, a data-rich, soft target. Um, and this slide is from a presentation from RSA, which many of you have likely heard of. Um, and they wanted to flip the security ROI question on its head. We have a lot of organizations that try to help schools, try to help uh, different industries calculate the ROI of investing in security. At RSA, they tried to flip that on its head and say, what does the adversary's ROI look like? After all, they don't really care what your investment is or what you're getting out of it. They care what they can get from an attack. Um, and when we look at how this plays out in higher ed, we see where part of the challenge starts to emerge. Um, when it comes to attack value, the data value minus the cost of the attack, higher ed looks like 10 industries in one to a potential attacker. Um, there's banking information. If you have a clinic on campus, there's likely healthcare, HIPAA protected data. There's tech R&D. There's lots of PII that might not be destroyed year after year. At the same time, success probability is probably relatively higher than in most industries. Um, higher ed is an industry that's often not prepared, not really sensitized to security. So you have a lot of hard to track vulnerabilities. You have research data email that's differently managed across colleges. You have faculty with servers under their desks. Um, you have mobile devices, vendors that might be managed at the unit level. Central IT is not always managing this. They don't even always know all the things that are happening. In addition, we see that higher education tends to carry a higher cost when breaches actually do happen. Um, the data on this slide is from the Poneman Institute. A quick show of hands. Does anyone, has anyone ever heard of the Poneman Institute? They're an interesting group. If you read the Verizon or Raytheon breach reports that come out every year, this is the organization that conducts that research. Um, what they've found over the last few years is that in the education sector, breaches tend to cost a lot more than the average industry. Um, so for higher education, we see that uh, you're paying about $294 per record loss per capita. That is per individual record, which is exposed during a breach, much higher than the all industry average of about $200. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are things that can really help. Uh, on the right side of the slide, the, that center line represents the average per capita cost of a breach. At the top, if you have a lost or a stolen device, breaches can cost a lot more, um, $16 more per record lost. Um, if there's a third party involved, if there are consultants engaged, you see that price start to go up and up. Uh, but if you have a CISO appointed, if you have a business continuity plan in place, if you have an incident response plan in place, you see dramatic reductions. And to put these numbers, which may look a little bit small into context, these are per record variations. And it's not uncommon to have a breach of 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 records. Those small numbers add up very, very quickly. But when we asked our members why they were so focused on security, why this was so urgent for them, they didn't often talk about the direct financial penalties that were associated. They had a, a little bit of more nebulous idea that the institution's reputation would be at risk. And this is something actually that we hear a lot. Um, we probably had dozens of calls where we heard, if we have a breach, students will stop coming to the university, they won't be able to trust us with their information, they'll go somewhere else and we'll suffer. And we tried to demonstrate that, we tried to quantify that, uh, and all the available data tends to show that when it comes to student enrollments, there's very little risk um, that we see through cybersecurity breaches. Students appear mostly unfazed by this. Um, on the left side of the slide, this is uh, survey data of institutions that had seen a breach happen within the last year, and they asked those organizations, did you see abnormal customer churn, that is, customer turnover, uh, leaving to go to somewhere else after a breach? We see that higher ed's right near the bottom, relatively unaffected. On the right side, we tried to quantify what reputation might look like. We tracked very, very large breaches. Uh, these are three breaches within the last decade of at least 195,000 records lost. And then we looked at undergraduate applications after a major breach event. You can see for yourself that there's little to no effect. Um, in fact, if you went by the data alone, you might be led to expect that applications would go up. 
Um, when we looked at this data, we also looked at yield rates, we looked at the academic strength of the class. For all of the enrollment indicators that our VPs of enrollment management really care about, it doesn't look like student enrollment is at risk during a breach. But there are some other areas on campus where we want to take reputation more seriously. And one of them is in the research enterprise. Um, the schools in the room that do a lot of uh, research will, will understand this. Um, a lot of agencies and industry partners are really security aware uh, repeat purchasers. In the first place, federal funding over the last decade has gotten a lot more cumbersome, a lot more competitive. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate encryption, detailed data management plans, um, secure data transfer, the grant approval rates are down, the total funding is down. And this shift in federal funding has accompanied sort of a sea change in how university research is funded across higher ed. Um, we're relying more and more on private industry partnerships. Uh, university of Michigan is a very good example here. Um, in 2013, they lost about 9.6 million in NIH funding and we're able to replace nearly all of that with new industry partnerships. Um, in total, industry partnerships are now about 8% of all sponsored research at University of Michigan. And EAB recently started working with uh, VPs of research, and they're telling us that they're worried that corporate partners are looking for reasons to say no. They're extremely sensitive um, to what they perceive as threats to their IP, uh, to their own information. Um, they're afraid that if they don't have security and compliance, if they can't get data management down, um, it'll be grounds to put them out of the running in a very quickly changing funding environment. And there's one final area where we see um, some interesting risks in terms of reputation from cybersecurity. Uh, the slide on the left here will likely be more relevant for our folks from community colleges, from public universities. Um, there was a state flagship school um, on the Canadian border that recently experienced a spear phishing attack. Um, spear phishing is a targeted email attempting to uh, embed a program or extract information from a user um, tailored to what that user would expect to see in a real email. There was a phishing attack, a spear phishing attack on the cabinet of a major university. Um, click here to process your 2% raise. Um, all of you in the room know that that email would never look that way. It would never come to the CBO. Uh, click here to process. But a few people did click in, uh, their credentials were loaded somewhere else, their checks were eventually diverted, and it was only 10 people. It was not a huge risk to the institution as a whole. The aftermath is where things got more interesting. They found that in the next round of funding negotiations, when they were talking with the legislative committees that were determining university budgets, there was much more scrutiny. Uh, they were looking into security and IT spending across the system. Uh, they were asking for more reporting. In general, they were putting more pressure on administrative spending, on administrative funding, because the legislature felt that the university couldn't protect itself. Why should we give you more? The example on the right, or the examples on the right, might be more relevant for uh, private universities, but I think they have context for all of us. Um, I'm actually here, as Floyd mentioned, from Washington, D.C. If uh, you've been following the campaign at all, and if you know how not to follow the campaign, I would appreciate that. Um, You've likely heard a few somewhat derogatory comments about the 1% uh, over the last few months. Um, whatever you think about the politics there, we think that within higher education fundraising, there could be some truth to the idea that a smaller and smaller share of donors is having a very, very big impact. Um, between 2006 and 2011, the share of total capital campaign dollars coming from the top 1% of donors, that is the top echelon of fundraisers, went from about two-thirds to about three-quarters of all campaign dollars. Um, when you add in the top 5% of donors, you see that you're getting very, very, very high. And when you rely that heavily upon a very small group of individuals, that comes with a, a different kind of risk, um, the risk of individuals getting mad and leaving. Um, and we heard cautionary tales from our friends in advancement, uh, a donor who walked away from an anonymous gift after their anonymity was lost. Um, a device that was lost that had secured donor data on it um, in an airport. Uh, one of my favorite examples, there was a divorce attorney in New York who was trying to hack in to a university's advancement shop to get the details of a planned gift. They felt that the gift was better spent in um, other ways by the uh, soon-to-be ex-spouse. But the big story here is that as we rely more heavily 
on this small group of people. Um, the folks in research, uh, the folks in the, uh, the CBO's office, the folks in advancement likely are going to be some of your biggest allies because their biggest concerns are having more and more to do with research, with uh, security, pardon me. So why is this hard? Why, why is this so difficult in higher ed? Um, we think that higher ed is uniquely difficult to secure because of its very nature, its openness, its academic freedom, and its shared governance. Um, in the first place, you have a constantly changing user base that's almost unique among um, industries. You have collaborative researchers going around the globe with their devices. Uh, you have new students coming in with 10, 20 connected devices. At the same time, you're profoundly decentralized. You might have hundreds of units that are virtually autonomous when it comes to um, how they use technology. You have a very wide range of IT literacy. You might have a, a, a Luddite professor of classics working right next to a world-class computer scientist. At the same time, IT has very few enforcement mechanisms. You have very few ways to force people um, to get this done. On the one hand, you're determined to stay this way. Uh, you're by design focused on transparency. You, the, the bedrock mindset you have tilts toward academic freedom. But this makes you uniquely risky. Um, you're heavily regulated. You have more risk-producing constituencies than almost any other industry. And as a result, we see more than our share of breaches that are uh, really preventable. Problems caused by lack of security hygiene, we find, are about twice as prevalent in higher education as they are in other industries. Uh, the data on this slide is from a group called the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. Uh, it's a California-based nonprofit that collects publicly reported breaches, tracks the industry that was affected, the number of records that were lost, um, in an attempt to get information out there and help people understand when their information may have been exposed. And what we see when we take higher, higher education and compare it to all of their industries, we see that areas where simple user errors may be prevalent, um, in unintended disclosure, in hacking and malware, tend to be a lot higher in higher education. And what these things have in common is unhygienic behaviors, not patching software, not encrypting emails, downloading programs, clicking on a phishing email. These are the behaviors that tend to cause this. I wanted to give some real life examples of unintended disclosure and hacking and malware, um, actually that have happened just in the last few weeks. Um, for hacking and malware, uh, the uh, a university in Florida, a University of Central Florida, I believe, recently experienced a pretty large breach when they noticed somebody had accessed um, a server, about 60,000 records were exposed, and the FBI now has two people in custody. That was classified under hacking and malware. In unintended disclosure, uh, Southern New Hampshire University recently saw about 140,000 records exposed when a vendor made a configuration error um, when they were transferring information and exposed that to the open web. Uh, to put 140,000 into context, when I added up all of the students that were currently enrolled at the universities in the room, um, it was about 145. So if you can imagine every single school, you just lost every single current student. That's the scale of these kinds of breaches. So what has been our approach so far? What has higher ed done uh, to make this better? What we see in general is security as campaign, mass marketing to try to get people uh, practicing hygienic behaviors. And we think that there are probably diminishing returns to this approach. Um, Every year, likely during the month of October, um, or potentially after a, a breach event in a relevant industry or nearby, there'll be some kind of campaign that gets kicked off. There'll be security flyers, email reminders, you'll start to make an impact, people will come to events. But at some point you reach saturation. Uh, if people aren't internalizing why it matters for them, um, if you're not educating them why it's relevant to their day to day, uh, eventually the communication won't reach everyone, there'll be turnover in staff, Next October, next time this happens, you have to do this all again, but now you need a louder message, you need wackier posters, you need um, more exciting emails. It's not sustainable. And I wanted to put some real examples up on the screen for all of you. Uh, do you think there are really limitations to treating security awareness like a, like a marketing campaign? These clever, clever-ish cues might catch the eye, but they might not really be educating people. And these are not uncommon. Uh, this poster on the left, don't fall for the fish stick. Uh, what is told instead of why me? Don't click on the phishing email, but why should I care? I'm a faculty member, I'm a student. Why is this relevant to me? Um, it's coming from IT, not from managers, not leveraging their personal networks. 
And it's relying on entertainment, on shock value, on ubiquity. Eventually, putting up posters, people are going to stop paying attention. Uh, this is from Yale University, a uh, university actually that's extremely good at a lot of these things. This is a result of trying to scale as quickly as possible, trying to get information out as quickly as we can. They put a, uh, a student in a fish costume to go talk to people about the dangers of fishing, so we wonder if there might be an additional risk of dehydration on a hot September day. Um, the question is, is there a way to do this better? Um, can we improve the status quo, uh, the campaign mentality of security awareness? Um, a few years ago, some researchers at Syracuse University uh, looked at security behaviors of end users and taxonomized them based on the intent of the individual involved and their expertise in IT, and they categorized them into these six different spaces. Um, on the far left, you have truly malicious intent. I want to hurt the university, I want to hurt other people, I'm intentionally breaking in, I'm uh, misusing uh, files in a detrimental way. On the far right, you have people that are secure, that are benevolent, um, maybe they're reliably hygienic, they just kind of follow the rules, maybe they're proactively secure. Um, in the center, we have people who are just unintentionally unsecure. There's nothing bad about their intentions. They're just trying to do their jobs, but the way they're doing it is causing security challenges. And where we think that higher education has the largest opportunity to improve security, um, and the biggest ROI is not at the far left, but really in the middle. We think that the vast majority of our campus constituents are making my naive mistakes, are tinkering with technology in a way that they're just trying to get things done, but is unsafe. We think that if we can start to migrate people from this zone of unintentional unsecurity into reliably hygienic behaviors, that's where higher ed IT can get the most bang for its buck, where you can really leverage um, your face-to-face -face time. And if you can start to do that, if you can move people from naive mistakes into reliably hygienic, it means that you can take really valuable staff time and start to devote it to these malicious folks who are relatively rare, relatively expensive to prevent, but are truly dangerous to the institution. And with that, uh, I wanted to share what we think are the, the four big imperatives for elevating security awareness. We think there, there are four big challenges that higher ed IT needs to deal with. First is in hardwiring breach response. Um, most of our schools, unfortunately, are not really prepared for a breach event in terms of uh, the larger, uh, the strategy folks up in the cabinet all the way down through the faculty. Um, we think that if we can really help campus be secure, be resilient, when breaches happen, um, we can go a lot of the way towards minimizing their cost. I'll talk about incident managers and about time to response tracking. Second thing challenge is making risks relevant. Um, there's frankly a very defensible reason that faculty members tend to sort of ignore a lot of the messages that come flying at them about security. It's not clear why it matters to them. If you're not telling them about something that matters for their research niche, for their students, frankly, they have a lot of demands on their time. You have to make it clear why it matters for their day to day. I'll talk about board education memos and about unit level risk profiles. Third is demonstrating vulnerability. We need to be able to show people that it is you right now in this place that is at risk. It has to be vivid, it has to explain, it has to show them uh, very viscerally that this is a vulnerability that matters right now. And finally, uh, the holy grail of security awareness, uh, real incentives. Um, relatively rare, but can be extremely powerful. Um, I'll talk briefly about breach chargebacks. To begin, um, I want to go back to, uh, to 2014 uh, at the University of Maryland, um, and where they saw, as I mentioned, that very, very large breach. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with some of the details, the collaboration website that was not protected, the data destruction policy that was not followed um, stringently. What you might not have heard as much about was that the lack of a pre-wired response um, invited a lot of hasty decisions and a lot of duplicative effort. Essentially, because they didn't have a, a really hardwired, pre-wired campus ready to go when a breach happened, they found themselves living in the worst of both worlds. The somewhat chaotic uh, nature of this slide is trying to show that breaches can be very stressful, very chaotic, um, very wild. Somebody has to contact the local media. Somebody else needs to contact law enforcement. Who's determining the size and scope of damage? 
uh, should the general counsel talk to the police? Who's in charge of that? And that question, who's in charge, gets really, really critical. And if you don't know it, you can have some big challenges. In the first place, big decisions can be made far too quickly. Uh, you might have somebody promising free credit reports for 10 years, um, making unprecedented promises um, just to get people focused. Um, at the University of Maryland, they promised a security audit, a comprehensive audit, top to bottom, of every single IT system in the entire system. Um, they did not necessarily talk to the CIO or the CISO about that before they made that promise. You can imagine huge costs associated with that. They also had multiple revisions of the actual size of the breach in the media. You had multiple individuals that were communicating with different uh, news organizations. Somebody would say 300,000, somebody else would say two. Um, what ended up happening is they just looked that they weren't prepared. They didn't look professional in the way that they were communicating. At the same time those big decisions were happening too quickly, very routine things happened far too slowly. Um, no one was sure who was in charge of big decisions. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the biggest takeaways from the University of Maryland's breach is know who your crisis vendors are. Have that Relodex on hand at the CIO's desk all the time. The last thing you want to do is have an RFP at midnight while a breach event is happening and the media is at the door. Um, and they were making duplicative law enforcement requests. One of the biggest takeaways, one of the biggest recommendations that schools that have gone through a breach tell us is uh, move away from the foundational practices that you see here. Um, most of us have classified the information we hold based on its sensitivity. Most of us have defined some escalation pathways. Um, try to get even faster. Um, speed is really the name of the game when it comes to breach response. It's going to tie up your most competent, likely your most expensive staff. It's going to require very expensive legal support. It's going to uh, require forensic IT vendors. This is a lesson that's been learned in a lot of other industries, um, in healthcare especially, because business distraction, living with a breach for months on end, um, is a matter literally of life and death. We think that we need to be getting even faster, starting to really organize the, the response and make the processes a lot more efficient. One of the keys is having an incident manager, someone who will be in charge of decisions um, during a breach event. A single owner, we are told, reduces the lag time that you see accessing experts and notifying stakeholders. And a breach response leader is not necessarily someone very senior. Um, it's sometimes seen as like a field promotion um, for a junior IT person. What we see is that they have six core responsibilities. The first is to be available 24-7. Um, they need to drop everything to focus on the incident. And this helps us get by a, a strange problem that you see during breach events. Uh, when you have people working from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, documenting process and getting things done, when it switches over to the night shift, if there's not someone to document and make sure that all that information is shared, they're likely going to do a lot of the same things again. You're going to lose very, very valuable time right when you need to be getting after it. This person is responsible for damage assessment. Uh, start to estimate the value of the compromised data, if systems need to be shut down, if there's a criminal investigation that needs to be underway. Uh, they're responsible for bringing up the response team. Often for smaller breaches, this will be a very small group of desktop network staff, but when it, get, when it starts to get bigger, it needs to involve the council's office. If there are employees involved, HR should be involved. Um, if there are HIPAA, FERPA, PCI data, your compliance officer will likely need to be in the room. And finally, communications once you start to see that victims need to be notified. This person is responsible for putting together uh, stakeholder notifications, need to know leadership updates, as well as notification for victims and the media. They're responsible for evidence collection, starting the case file and documenting key decisions that were made. And finally, and I think this could be one of the most important, starting the post-mortem analysis. As I mentioned, breaches are a question of when, not if. They're going to happen, they're going to happen again and again. Documenting the process that went on, understanding the root cause and updating standards and procedures is really, really critical to making us more efficient. And when it comes to efficiency, one of the best practices that we've seen across industries is time to response tracking. Um, and what we're talking about here is documenting process performance um, across four key areas, 
to streamline our future response. This is a practice we've seen um, more prevalent in private sector firms when they have uh, larger IT teams, but I've seen this at a public flagship um, out west, as well as at a small baccalaureate college in Pennsylvania. What they're doing is mapping the time it takes to identify that a breach has occurred, the time it takes to know what happened, what was the root cause of the breach, time it takes to fix the problem, contain, um, and the time it takes to verify. Now, the data that you see here is from a survey of international organizations from different industries. What I think is more important is when we can see this information, when we know how long it takes these four things to occur during a breach, we can start to parse that. We can say, are we getting faster? Did we respond to this one better than the last one? Um, are responses in some units slower than others? You can almost guarantee this will be the case. Um, how does response time vary by the kind of information that was at risk? You need to really limit your urgency to data that needs to be protected. Um, HIPAA-protected data has much larger penalties associated with it, for example, than FERPA-protected data. And what you can do with this information over time is you can start to inflect the operational costs of a data breach. Um, Time-based metrics can enable you to do much more targeted remediation. Now, the data on here is completely representative. This is not meant to be uh, a real university's information. But when you have, uh, for example, there was a breach in PCI data. We knew it happened within 15 minutes. Um, we knew what went wrong within one hour. We could verify everything was fixed within a day. Well, for something like that, controls might be working well. The process works. Let's stay on it. Let's make sure that it's consistent. Um, but when it comes to other kinds of data, for example, you might see that there's a big lag uh, between identification and knowing the root cause. Uh, can we focus on a faster root cause analysis? What prevented us from figuring that out? Uh, for a third example, if you have just dramatically slow response, and this is not uncommon actually to have months go by before you really know what happened, um, you might just need significant work. It could mean process redesign, it could mean retraining for the IT staff in those units. What I want to talk about next is making risks relevant for end users. As I mentioned, I think we need to be uh, a lot more sensitive to the idea that if we're not telling people why it matters for them, they don't have a good reason to care about information security. Good example is at the highest strategic level of the institution, uh, the board of trustees and the cabinet. And what CIOs told us again and again was that they were really struggling to keep leaders at a, an appropriate level constructively engaged, informed, but not freaking out about security. And what we see far too often is represented here. Most of the time, uh, senior leaders are relatively apathetic about information security. It's highly technical. They're not quite sure what all this stuff means. Um, geez, can we talk about our actual strategic priorities? But then something will happen. Maybe there's a breach down the road. Maybe there's an event that happens at an institution nearby. And suddenly there's an overreaction. Uh, I need to have the CIO in here for 10 hours on Saturday to brief everyone about what happened, stop everything. And where we want to be is that dotted orange line in the middle. We want to have a constructive engagement about security. Um, let's talk about how to minimize the impact of a thing that we'll know will happen. Let's talk about how to be resilient. This is a problem that was faced by the CIO at Brown University in Rhode Island. And their response, we thought, was very clever. They took these mainstream news events that were really exciting board members and cabinet members, and they turned those, they converted those into an education opportunity about Brown's IT uh, security. What does this mean? Uh, there's two representative examples of what a, a breach, uh, a board education memo might look like. On the left, uh, Target says that 70 million people were hit in a data breach. Uh, your board members, your uh, provost, your CBO might have read this in the Wall Street Journal quickly summarize what happened in the event, what vulnerability was seen. Uh, I think it was an HVAC vendor at Target that was exposed to a phishing attack. Um, potential impact millions in costs. They could lose customers' goodwill. They could see share pr prices decline, which they did uh, very briefly. And then they pivot. Um, what do we have at Brown University to help with this? Do we have agreements with our vendors in systems like the HVAC? Um, are we exposed? And a representative takeaway could be, look, we have agreements with all of our vendors and critical systems. We're not at risk for this kind of attack. Um, we'll, we'll be happy to brief you on how we've responded, how we've checked our systems at the next board meeting, but for now, don't worry about this. 
a different kind of representative response uh, might be triggered by the University of Maryland. Um, the Chronicle covered this. Uh, likely this was discussed in a lot of provost cabinet, in a lot of president's cabinet and board meetings. Um, the vulnerability, there was an external collaboration website that was exposed. Um, there could be millions in credit monitoring costs. There could be reputational damage. Of course, we're not quite sure how seriously to take some of that. But what does Brown have to protect us? Uh, we have a, a data destruction policy that we think is state of the art. Um, we have network monitoring to make sure that when this kind of thing happens, we're ready for it. But we could be exposed. Uh, when we've gone out to talk to department leaders and unit leaders in different research centers, uh, and we ask them about consistent adherence to our collaboration policy, we get kind of muddy answers. We're not quite sure if we're ready for this. I'll tell you what, we're going to focus on this side of this for now. And when we come to the next board meeting, will tell you how we've improved. And when I asked the, uh, the CIO, the, the CISO at Brown, how they knew this was working, they shared uh, what I think is a good example, um, getting ahead of the, the shell shock bug. Uh, likely all of you will remember when shell shock hit, or, likely, or rather when it was discovered that we were vulnerable. Um, student Macs were vulnerable to use this required multiple rounds of patching by central IT. Um, in a typical situation like this, the, the CIO might have had to wait 60 days to brief the board on what had happened. In between then, they might have had five to 10 one-on-one -on -one conversations with individual board members, bringing them up to speed. A huge uh, time suck from them when they needed to be focused on what they were doing. When they had the breach education memo, uh, the CISO was tasked with doing all the research they could find within 24 hours. Um, they, took 20, they took 45 minutes, wrote down the memo, sent it over, and that was it. Um, the board knew what had happened. They knew why it mattered for Brown. They knew the protections that Brown had. Um, and they knew that Brown's IT team was on it, was moving forward. And what they found is that this is getting them a lot more productive and proactive when they discuss security and IT issues. Uh, they don't have to start from zero, which is a problem that we hear a lot. They can immediately have a more informed conversation about what needs to change. If you're interested in something like a, a board education memo, um, what we've heard is that one per month is really pushing it in terms of frequency. Once per semester is too slow, people will stop, losing, will stop being interested. What's key is to target them to the kinds of news that they'll be reading already. Um, convert that interest and that excitement about an event that's already happening into a really productive education moment. The second area where I want to talk about making risks relevant is in uh, department leadership, particularly academic um, and faculty leadership. Um, and frequently we see schools relying on reach and mass marketing because frankly relevance is hard, it's expensive. Uh, few institutions are really tailoring the education that they do for end users. Uh, we see that online training, having something on the website, sending email reminders, that's very common. Uh, these are push messages are going out to everyone on campus saying the same thing. Um, it's a little bit less common to have standard training involved, um, and it's very uncommon to have really customized messages about why people should care. Um, a workshop that describes why exactly this matters to you, a role-based training session. And as a result, a lot of these have very little impact. Um, it's not necessarily relevant to the work tasks. I have 60 hours of work to do this week. Why should I take time for IT security? It's not uh, relevant to my professional goals. I'm trying to get tenure. Why does this matter? And it's not leveraging personal networks. I'm used to listening to my dean about uh, these kinds of issues. When I hear it from them, I'll start to pay attention. And as a result, a lot of us are stuck on the left. Um, we're yelling at academic units to comply with basic hygiene rules when we go out and visit them. And we have that very rare, potentially very valuable face-to-face -face time. Um, a lot of local check-ins are focused on messaging generic vulnerabilities. If you don't do this, the institution will be at risk. If you don't do this, um, all of our students, all of what we do could be in danger. Essentially, consequences described at the institutional level are way too abstract to get people's attention. And where we've seen a lot of um, progressive CISOs moving is to um, having more of a poll message. Um, they're asking for insight into high-profile academic activities that are going on, major research initiatives, if there are folks abroad doing work, um, and they can focus their valuable face-to-face -face time, that education time, on understanding academic research and tailoring the risk message to project-specific vulnerabilities. Um, a few quick examples. Um, 
this is really about showing people that security risks are relevant to the things that you're working on right now, your life's work. Um, if you have a federally funded study on medical device surgical impacts, you have a lot of grant funding that could be at risk if you can't protect your information. Um, the NIH has actually in the past sometimes required payback of funds already spent. Um, let's talk about what you've done. You, faculty member A, do you have a data management plan? Yes. Uh, have you done your software patching? Yes. That's great. But the vendors you're working with, um, you haven't really fixed their access. Let's focus in on that the next time we get together. Um, if you have a cutting edge textbook on intervention, interventional radiology, we've seen many, many examples of books that have been worked on for many years that uh, end up published for free online just before the deadline. Um, hackers might steal a textbook and post it on the internet for free. Do you change your passwords regularly? Do you have secure data transfer? Uh, your password's not very strong. That's where we need to focus. And it's not about scaring people. When I say threats to my life's work, that may be putting it a little bit too strongly. Um, this isn't about an upgraded version of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This is really about tailoring our education, tailoring our message to the things that people really care about, to the things that they're going to pay attention to, and that will have sustainable impact over time. The third big challenge uh, that we hear our members talk about is demonstrating vulnerability. Uh, vividly showing people that it is you that is at risk, it is you that needs to care about this right now. And one of the best uh, examples um, that we've seen in showing people that they're vulnerable is uh, something that you've all likely heard about, um, and I know the folks at KSU are actually very good at, uh, self-phishing, um, which can be great in theory, but potentially very distracting in practice. Um, Quick show of hands, how many institutions in the room have actually done um, self-phishing for their own organizations? Okay. So that's pretty common. Usually there's maybe one school in the room that's done this, and there's a pretty good reason. Um, it can cause a lot of distraction. There can be hard feelings. If you can't manage the process really well, um, it can go wrong. And what I mean when, go, when I say go wrong, um, you might be courting a time-consuming confusion. If you're telling people um, that their account has been hacked, that their account verification is needed, that direct deposit update is required. If you are phishing your own constituents to try to help them see that they are vulnerable to similar messages from malicious folks, um, they might be reaching out to organizations all across campus, bothering them, taking up a lot of their time. They might be calling the IT help desk. They might be calling HR, the vendor. They might be worried, am I in trouble for this? Um, and this can take a lot of time away from the campaign and start to make it potentially not worth it. The biggest lesson, lesson that we hear from uh, people that do self-phishing is that you have to pre-wire campus. Um, you can't treat this as a way to surprise people or to catch people off guard. This has to be treated as a really constructive education opportunity. A targeted preparation maximizes your campaign benefits. So this is an example from Eastern Michigan, but I could have pulled something similar from dozens of schools, private and public, that have done this. Um, prior to the campaign going live, what they'll do is message uh, managers across campus, tell them why the campaign is happening, why it's worthwhile. Um, they'll message users, you're being selected at random here, there's absolutely no penalties, there's nothing punitive about this. Um, they'll call the services around campus, like the help desk, uh, like other folks, tell them to expect a call volume to increase. It's also extremely helpful to provide them with template scripting when people have common questions. And after the go live, uh, the person that is fished successfully um, is immediately uh, replied to. They get an instant notification. It's non-punitive. You're reinforcing the policy that they apparently did not recognize. And it's linking them to trainings at the point of vulnerability. Um, in the modern workforce, email is probably the most fundamental thing that most of us do. If you can show people that the act of emailing can have inherent risks, that can be a huge way to help them be more secure. And why do people do self-phishing? If it courts time-consuming confusion, if you have to pre-wire, it sounds like a lot of work. And the reason is it helps you move in the right direction. Um, this is data, again, from Eastern Michigan. What they found is that students and faculty are much better prepared after being self-phished. They're more likely to be suspicious, aware of the potential of a threat, um, and over time they've seen dramatic decreases in the number of accounts that were compromised. Uh, 
Uh, I believe that Kansas State does have a presentation on self-fishing, so I want to make a plug for them. We've been very impressed by their work here and in uh, tracking how fishing is detrimental for campus and in uh, giving folks on campus a really clear idea of what fishing scams actually look like. This is a, a sample pre-wire email or representative communication that we put together. Um, and I've outlined the core components on either side. Uh, real campus evidence is driving urgency. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate why this is happening in hopefully a very simple metric. We're seeing a large increase in the incidence of uh, new phishing attacks or compromised accounts. Um, here's how it will affect you. Um, here's, here's the education pointers that we think are critical. Here's an explanation of the consequences, i.e. there never should be consequences for self-phishing. And here's an easy route to additional information. Um, self-phishing, as I mentioned, relatively rare in higher education, but a lot of other industries um, have really bought into this practice. Um, there was a multinational firm that uh, promised if they could get their self-phishing uh, vulnerability, if they could get 5% less people clicking through self-phishing emails, they would give everyone at their company an extra day off. Um, this amounts to five, $10 million in spend. The private sector really believes in this practice. We think that it has a lot of applicability and a lot of potential value for higher ed. The final place I wanna talk about is incentives. And as I mentioned, this is somewhat of a holy grail. Um, for CISOs, uh, IT doesn't always have a lot of ways to tell people what to do to force them to comply. Um, so incentives can be a little bit controversial. But there's a good reason why we should at least have the conversation. Breach costs, the cost of what happens when you have a breach event, are almost always invisible to the end users that are um, involved. Almost no one is charging back what can amount to hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars in spend. Um, and the reason is that breach charges are a cultural non-starter at a lot of schools. I heard a variation on this theme a lot. There's a part of me that says, yes, that's exactly what we need. God, let's get, engage the deans. They care about the budget. Um, but I don't think it would have the intended effect. We might end up with more resentment than awareness. We found only a handful of schools that actually charged individual units um, partial costs of a breach. And one of the most outspoken um, was Jerry McCartney, the CIO and VP for IT at Purdue University. He told us that breach chargebacks are really the ultimate attention getter. And the reason that they're worth considering, even though they're gonna cause potentially some heartache, some uncomfortable conversations, there's three big reasons. Uh, the first is that deans, um, powerful deans at, at large state schools are going to listen when budget is involved. Um, they're not going to necessarily care if the CIO is sending them angry memos. They're not necessarily, they might care, they do care about laws and regulations, but they're going to really pay attention when it comes out of their budget. Second reason, riskiest end users, uh, particularly research faculty, listen to deans. Um, they're going to feel very immune to consequences if it's only um, the CISO or the, the IT team sending them a message. A dean is someone they professionally cannot afford to ignore. And finally, deans talk to each other. Um, I think too often we think about communicating uh, IT security from the lens of IT talking to units when we can leverage units talking to each other, the natural conversations and relationships that are happening on campus, that's where you can get much more power and much more sustainable messaging. Once a word gets out, when a dean is charged for one of these, um, you don't need to do additional education. That's what Jerry's found. The informal networks are far stronger in communicating than you ever could be. I asked Jerry uh, many times for a a sense of, of how the breach chargebacks would work. What was the calculation that went in here? And he said the first thing um, that actually needs to be thought through is charging only units that quote unquote deserve it. Um, sort honest mistakes of folks that are doing the wrong thing but not intentionally um, from egregious behaviors. Um, and the decision tree works like this. Can the breach be traced to a specific unit? Was one single unit responsible for the problem? If no, they're exempted from the chargeback. If you can't sort how the College of Arts and Sciences and the, um, the Cancer Research Center were both involved in the server, no one can be charged. If yes, uh, Jerry asks, have they followed basic security protocols? Um, do they follow the basic hygienic behaviors? 
If yes, they'll be exempted. They did the best they could. We told them to follow basic hygiene and they did it. There's no reason to charge them. But if no, he asked one more question. Is this a repeat offender? Uh, likely all of you in the room know who the repeat offenders are on your own campuses. If they're making these kinds of mistakes over and over and over again, um, if the message isn't getting through by the fact that breaches and security challenges keep happening, that's where Jerry pulls the trigger and he says, that's when you're charged back um, for the cost of response, forensics, communication, remediation. Only when he goes through that entire process will he say, all right, that's enough, you're being charged. And what Jerry would tell you, this is not about uh, bullying or scaring those units um, that are the repeat offenders. Um, this is about engaging them and educating them about why this matters. It's about signal value, not cost recovery. Ultimately, no unit on campus, no academic unit will ever be probably an evangelist for IT security. Um, they can be your allies, they can be your friends, but security is not their job, it's yours. You want them to focus on their mission not cripple them by taking away their budget in a breach chargeback. Um, and what Jerry does is he undercharges as a rule. He'll tell them the breach details, the policy, um, that the unit has been unresponsive, here's how to prevent it in the future. But he'll undercharge as an absolute rule. This is about signal value, not trying to get costs back. Um, Jerry's an interesting uh, CIO, if anyone in the room has met him. Um, he'll give them a total charge only uh, when they actually ask for a line item um, then he'll start to bump up the price a little bit and there's a little bit of a surcharge for knowing the details. Uh, and with that, I think that, that wraps up the, the research that I brought about elevating uh, security awareness. Um, what I want to stress is that uh, a lot of what I talked through is about engaging more constructively. I think um, I was talking with Floyd just before the presentation that Security can be a tough topic because it feels like it never stops. Um, it's always going on. Uh, you always have to deal with it. Units are constantly told the same things over and over again. It can be easy to feel like there's no progress to be made. Um, and I think using some of these practices, and I would bet some of the things that you're doing on your own campus, we can be a lot more constructive. We can be a lot more creative. Um, we can help people see that security isn't an IT problem. It's part of an enterprise process that matters to the things they care about. And with that, I'd love to take uh, questions from the room. If we have time. I'm not sure that. Yeah, we have a few minutes. Do you have questions? We have a, oh. we have a little box. Yeah, so we can get the questions on the stream, live stream. So if you have one for Ben, I'll try to toss this gently to you and catch everybody's questions. So I'll start it out sure. then. Um, can you go back to slide 16? Sure. The one I'm interested in is, is, is I, I understand, you know, the hardwiring, the response process. Yep. And, and we, we look at this slide that talks about, you know, we're very, I, to me, uh, our security response sometimes is very, just that, it's very response. Yep. The, the hardwiring helps us prepare for that, certainly mm -hmm. improves it. What would be interesting for me is what should that curve look like? I mean, when we really think about how, instead of just being reactionary, how do we start thinking about a ongoing process, not only for hardwiring our response process, but for educating, motivating, and uh, looking at what happen is happening in the industry in terms of security and what should that curve really look like for us to be continuously prepared? Right. Well, and I think the, that's a, a very good question. I think what it boils down to is this graph essentially shows how we respond to the entire campus, um, how we go out and talk to every single person on campus with flyers, with sort of mass marketing tools. Um, Ultimately, what I think this needs to look like is not uh, a one-dimensional, here's what the campus should look like. I think every part of campus has a different appropriate engagement level for security. Um, for folks who are in the academy, they need to be engaged at um, a certain level, but it shouldn't be their day jobs. For people who have um, FERPA or HIPAA protected data that they work with every day, they should be a notch higher. Um, I think it's about decomposing the one-size-fits-all approach of you know, mass marketing into what should be kind of a, a horizontal, layered approach. Um, 
that's fitted to the different kinds of data access that we have. Hmm? Questions? Okay, so I'm gonna toss this to you and see if we can catch it. it won't hurt. <laughs> okay. So we're from K-State, and you're right. talking, and what my thought of self-phishing is different from what you're, I think, you are defining self-phishing as. Okay. Because I'm thinking of the word trickery, and, but right. that's not what you mean, right? You mean we are policing ourselves in terms of phishing. Is that what you mean? Well, I think uh, when I say self-phishing, what I'm referring to is the... Um, someone using potentially a vendor like FishMe or um, the central IT shop will draw up fake emails um, saying things like uh, click here to process your raise or enter your credentials here and they'll send those out to individual pockets of campus to uh, determine whether or not those parts of campus are at risk. A lot of people do see that as trickery. I think um, there's often an, uh, a reaction that you know, you're, oh, sorry, uh, you've, you've lied to me, you've, uh, you've attacked me um, and people can feel I think angry and that's a little bit of what I talked about here. Um, I think it's not necessarily seen as trickery. The schools that can successfully pre-wire, I think it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot different on different campuses when IT has different kinds of relationships with um, folks on campus, but schools that can pre-wire effectively, um, they've told me that, uh, and the best example I've heard, a, a woman came up to the CISO and gave him a big hug. She had no idea that she was in danger. She, had, she just thought it was okay to put in her credentials. To her, it was um, a benefit. It was an amenity, almost a gift from IT teaching her that she was at risk and she didn't know it before. But I think that requires a very, very careful and coordinated approach. Oh, okay. Got it. Other questions or comments for Ben? Okay, so. Ben, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, folks. That one's back. Hear me. Check, 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 check. So it's about ten till two. What I would do, encourage you to uh, visit with some folks that you haven't seen for a while. We're all here together for the next day. You have plenty of time now until 2.30 where our next round of sessions begin to wander around and meet with some of the vendors. Uh, there still may be some snack food in there. Again, welcome to Washburn, check 2016, and um, uh, let's go to our sessions and visit the vendors. Thank you.
there's a wireless presentation mouse. So okay. if you do that, I mean, you can have the um, person, if he'd rather be walking in mobile air mic, then he has to make sure he doesn't step behind this mic if somebody else wants to be. If he stays far enough away from this mic, it'd be okay? Yeah. Okay. Or if you want to... You want to go like this? We can log both of you. And I turn this one off, and then it doesn't matter. Where you, like, we can go up here. Here he comes. Let's see. See what he'd rather do. She's talking to us about what we want to do with the mic situation, and I said you probably want to walk around. Well, I'm always standing I'm still all the time. <laughs> Never the case. <laughs> so I figured you'd want the the mic. She said if you stay far enough away from this, we should be able to run this. Well, too. yeah. So I can't have like like the main presenter that uh, right, he that walked was, behind there and I yeah, still had this one on. Awful. I felt like I was in like one of those <laughs> yeah, this is or war camps or something where they were doing torture. So we <laughs> couldn't, yeah. If you want, and if you're you'd rather be walking, so let's lob both of you. Okay. And I'll turn this one off. Okay. And okay. then you can come back up and forth and Good it won't feed back. Does that sound like a plan? Yep, that'll work. And then at, at the end, um, I'll try to you know, if we're running close on time, I'll try to give you a five-minute thing and allow for questions at the end. So if, if you see that or if you end early, I'll just try to pay you attention. Know, I never talk about that. You don't? Okay. That's not, <laughs> I don't know yet. It's not true. Not <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to see if anybody will catch this as far as getting their questions because this room is the live stream, obviously. Okay. Oh, and I have one more thing. I have a release form that we like you to sign. Uh, Thank you. I know you guys did something but we're gonna have to sign a release form because they're live streaming and um, it gets recorded on YouTube. Okay. So let me go get that and then we'll get you mic'd up. Oh you probably want to pull that up. Let us know. Yep she said you can log into this one right here on your <laughs> cloud. Let's see. First name was Andrew. Andrew. You're Andrew. So Andrew Feldstein? Yes. Okay. Sure this browser isn't fully supported. For best keynote, use a supported browser. What's supported? Um, I'm going to try IE. I never tried it that, but I, I would have necessary. Hold I on. Think. Well, they put fire. If Firefox wasn't fully supported, do they have... Uh, I guess I'll try IE. Mm, I can ask one of our folks if there's... I mean, IE, I'm sure, works.
Andrew. Um, and I'll probably just stand off to the side with that catch box and, and introduce you. Sure. And you can start off. But let's go ahead and hit this mic. This is a, you can go on your waistband or you know, uh, pocket. You can. Put my you can. <laughs> Am I up? Oh, yeah. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks for your uh, working with me on all of this. And my timing. The what, I'm sorry? The timing. I'm, I'm live here. Oh, well, no, no, no. I was, uh, I don't know, I emailed you because I was coming back from the East Coast and coming oh. through. <laughs> what? what happened? I thought she turned this one off. Yeah. Maybe it was the box. Do you think we were too close?
that if you have a question, I'll either hand it to you or if you're willing to let me toss it to you, we'll try to get those questions on the live stream as well through this. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our presenters today. Uh, we have Andrew Feldstein and Kristen Rupp from Fort Hayes State University and they are going to talk to you about collaborative learning spaces. Hi everybody. Um, I, uh, I'm fairly new to Fort Hayes, I've uh, been there about 10 months and back in November they, we were moving all of learning technologies into one building so uh, what was Formerly, a division known as CTELT became Learning Technologies, which is the division I'm in charge of, and we were moving with the rest of Learning Technologies, and they were uh, moving us into a space uh, that had lots of boxes um, of, and rectangles and things that were just with, with walls. And they, they, there was a... Um, the space that we're looking at here, let's see, well, it looks different up here, doesn't it? All right, where's the, ah, here we go. This, this middle box in the middle was a, what was divided up into two rooms, one of which was one of, the, one of those traditional old-fashioned computer labs with the, with the rows and desks and, and computers all facing in the same direction, really great for collaborative work. Um, and then the area, this whole area here was, it was like a bunker where all the student workers worked on uh, broken computers and networking things. And, um, so basically, the, my stipulation as we went was to, was to take down all the walls. And so we, bid, we basically took down all the walls in that area. Um, and it opened it up into this space. I know that's not, I apologize, it's not really that large to see. But basically, it, it opened up the area so that we could create a space for people to work in. Um, we took taking away that lab to create a more open environment. Part of our responsibility is to deal with faculty development. Part of and, and part of faculty development isn't just you know getting faculty into one place to to, to sit them at desks to um, talk to them about different technologies or pedagogies or, or, or what have you. It's to get people talking together and thinking together and and, and working together and. The, the, the old space that we sort of, with the walls we tore out with those rows of desks and computers, I don't know, I mean, in my perspective, it's not conducive to much of anything, except you, it, it reminds me of, I guess, the early days of computing when people felt that that's what you had to do. Everyone was sitting at their own little desk and not working together, but working with something that was on the screen. So we created this very open space, and in this open space, and, and we'll talk about this more after, after Kristen goes through how this room was designed, but there were a lot of aspects that went into this room that are considerably more than the furnishings that went in there. And when we talk about, the, the, the primary word that we talk about when we talk about putting this room together is possibilities. Because it's not about having stationary areas where you can do this over here, you can do this over here. Um, it, it's about being able to, to, to move things around. It's being able to, in, you know, one of the things that we went away from when we moved to this new space from the old space was the old space was, was, that we had was mostly conference room space. And the problem with conference room space is everybody, ha everybody understands what they do when they walk into a conference room. There's a table. It's rectangular to some degree. There's chairs around it. Usually at one end there's a screen. Everybody walks in, they decide, okay, all right, how important am I at this meeting? All right, am I sitting in the middle over here? Am I sitting at the front over there? Uh, and so, but, but everybody understands their role walking into the room and the entire process of anything that happens in that room is basically dictated by the space. 
So the idea was to create a space that did not dictate function and process. And so we worked very hard at creating a space that would be flexible and open and basically create the idea of possibilities. So I'm going to ask Kristen to, to go through and, and sort of lay out the whole room for you. OK. Thank you. OK, so my role in this project was basically to sit down with Andrew and our purchasing and facilities offices and get a plan together. Um, find out what Andrew wanted for the room um, and figure out what furniture and what design we needed to do um, to make that happen for him. Um, so the furniture was one of the things that we looked at first. Um, the design was kind of more on the facility side, but um, basically the design was easy. It was take down every wall. Simply, um, that's what we, and that's what we ended up doing. Um, so we looked at Han, Han and steel case, um, options of furniture, um, just looking at what they had um, that would be flexible um, and adaptable the way that Andrew wanted the space. Um, and we found that Han um, was probably the most budget friendly um, and met all of our needs. So we ended up um, purchasing all Han furniture throughout the space. Am I cutting in and out? Okay. <laughs> okay, so for the tables for the space, we went with Han's Motivate series. Um, you can see their catch line, adapt, react, motivate. Um, that really fit well with exactly what Andrew um, wanted for the space. Um, so we ended up going with that line. It's a really cool line of furniture. Um, has a lot of different options. All wheels, um, some of them are height adjustable. There's a lot of different features that you can get um, with them. So I'll show you what we ended up purchasing. Um, we got six uh, 24 by 60 inch tables, all on wheels. Um, ours are all fixed, but they do have some different options for um, nesting and folding um, and then height adjustable. We also got two bar height peninsula tables. You can see off in the back corner there um, each of those has a display above them. And then we also got um, two 60-inch half round tables on wheels. Um, so those two can go together. You'll have a circle table. You can put them with your rectangle tables. And it just creates a lot of flexible ways that you can move those around in the space. For the chairs, we went with Han, again, the Purpose Series, um, which is just a chair that's supposed to be really good in multi-purpose type rooms. Um, so for this room, there could be meetings that people would maybe be there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, to meetings where they might be there all day. So we were looking for a chair that was um, ergonomical, um, comfortable, and we found that this chair um, was the best fit. So we have 20 of those chairs, and then we also have the 12 bar height stools to go with the peninsulas. We also added a soft seating area. Um, again, all on wheels, that was the key thing that we looked for was um, mobility, so those can be moved around wherever we need to um, throughout the space. Um, so we have four of the modular chairs, and then we have three cube seats. Um, so for the room equipment, um, we got the presentation cart, which was part of the Motivate series, which is the same line as the tables, um, and that cart has been really cool. It's um, on wheels so we can move it around um, for Andrew he likes to walk around a lot of presenters like to walk around they I can didn't move want that. A podium. <laughs> the last thing I wanted was 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 a po again this is form and function what this is and the piece that we got and you, what you can see if you look at the bottom left picture there's a little podiumish thing on top we don't have that uh, it's just basically a platform you can put a PC on top of it you can put a wireless a keyboard and mouse that will actually go right to the Clary Icon screen that we have there. It, it's on wheels so that you can, you can move with it so that depending upon who's in the room and how everyone has configured the room that day, and we'll talk about different ways people tend to configure the room, you can take and move that podium around uh, so that it's, it's helpful. We found that, actually we didn't start with that module. We, this room is still developing, it's not done. And we'll talk about that too, but people said, okay, where do I put my computer? Or I, I need something for my notes. Or, and so we got 
that piece which is very minimal but very movable, but not invasive into the room and in keeping with the surroundings, uh, which was de is designed to have, th there shouldn't be that one iconic piece of furniture that designates, I'm the leader of this room. <laughs> but we tried very carefully not to have that. Yes. Um, along those same lines, we got the two mobile marker boards. Those are also the Motivate series by Han. We've also found those to be extremely useful. Um, little group sessions, breakout sessions, we can move those around and do group work. Um, that's been really nice. And, and those go nicely along with the seven wall-mounted whiteboards throughout the space. Um, we have three wall-mounted displays, um, two above the peninsula tables, and then we have one over in more of the open area with the circle table. And then um, the big piece of equipment in the room is our 84-inch Clary Icon um, interactive touch screen display. Um, that's actually a computer. Um, and I'll let Andrew kind of go into more detail about that. But that pretty much r sums up what we have in the room. Um, all really mobile, adaptable, comfortable, um, and going along with that idea of keeping the room open and flexible. All right, let's see what else we have. First impressions. We had... Um, there's not a lot of equipment in the room. There's not a ton of computers. There's not a ton of any of switches or interactive anythings in the room. The room has, as Kristen said, the one Clary icon. There's three other wall-mounted displays. There are switches in the, in the large. If you look on the end where the, where the wall mount display, there, there, there are switches in. There's HDMI connectivity in those so that uh, people can bring their computers to it, plug in, and, and whoever is in, in the group can uh, present on the large screen for a group working around one of those spaces. Uh, the, the small displays are also connected to the Clary icon. So if you want something to be displayed, not just on, it, something's on the Clary icon, and there are people over in the other spaces that same um, presentation or whatever whatever you wanted to put on the Clary icon will be echoed on those other screens so that the people at the other tables can see that or they can switch it to whatever they're doing. Lots of HDMI connectability. But at the end of the day, that's it for equipment. But consistently, people walk into the space and say, man, I wish I had all this equipment. But the reason I think that they're doing that is because they see in this room possibilities. They see that they can do a lot of stuff there. And sometimes that gets equated to the amount of equipment that you pack into a room, where in fact, this room is designed very specifically just to create spaces so lots of things can happen. If you look at the, the main area of the room here, you can sort of see um, there's the two U-shaped bar height tables, which are often in the back. Um, there are some of the other Han modular tables in the front. You can move those, all of those, everything except the two bar height tables are on wheels. Even the, the sofa pieces and the ottoman pieces are all on wheels. So you can move stuff wherever you want to move it. And people tend to do that. One of the more interesting things that, that happened was the first time we had a major meeting of, of our, our ERP work group was, was using the room. And they came in and they, we had the table set up in little square groupings around the room. They came in and, and I had walked out and the next thing I knew, they came in and they'd configured it like a conference room. A, a little piece of me died at that moment. But that was what they were used to working in. And they basically faced everything towards the Clary icon and moved everything around in a U shape. They've had meetings since, and they've started to, to see that they can actually move the furniture and that other types of conversations happen and other, other more interesting things can happen if the screen doesn't become the center of attention and everybody's around the room in a U-shape. Again, you can see, well, that picture's a little dark, but everything is on wheels in the room. Uh, one of the first things that we did was we had a technology services meeting in this, in this space with about 40 people and it was just they people just moved stuff around and, and created a, 
a, a really kind of neat environment that was informal in a way, but it was extremely effective and extremely comfortable. The amount of interaction that people were having in the room in that meeting compared to the meetings that had been held in, in, in one of the lecture halls or in, where else did you hold? Pretty much just classrooms. In classrooms. When you, again, a classroom's like a, like a conference hall. You, there's a certain expectation of, of the way things are lined up and certain behaviors are expected based upon that. If you, if you take that away and create a space where people say, I'm not exactly sure that I have to behave in a very specific way in this room, they will then start maybe being themselves. And, and that's what we've seen happen. Uh, connectability, I, I, I use that word very carefully because it's not about connectivity, it's about connectability. It's about being able to, by the way, um, if anybody's ever interested what we're showing on that screen, there's one of my favorite things. It's, uh, it's a website called listen.hatnote.com, and it's basically a visualization of Wikipedia edits in real time. Yeah, and it, every time a bubble pops up, that's somebody who has edited that page on the Wikipedia. And, it, and there's a, like a little zen chime that comes out when each one comes up. The bigger the bubble, the bigger the edit. Um, and if you want to see what those edits are, because there's a touch screen, you can just go up and you can say, oh, there's a, you know, a new edit on um, Donald Trump. They seem to pop up way too often. You just, you just click on the screen, it'll take you to the Wikipedia page, not to the front page with the article, but to the back page where you can see the actual edit that just took place. So that's very cool. Uh, but anyway, connectability in the space. We talked about the HDM, HDMI connections. We talked about the possibility that this screen can talk to the other screens. But it doesn't mean that you have to set up this very, very rigid structure to do that. It means you have to have the ability for people to be able to connect when they want to either through the computers or just within the room themselves, with just people talking to one another. It doesn't have, this doesn't have to be the center of the room. When you set it up as a conference table where that is the center of the room, that's the assumption. But if you, every time people set it up with a conference table, I, when they leave, I move the tables back in hopes that they'll leave them in a more flexible position. Um, and then there's an area where, where our student workers are working. Um, that's one of the, the neat thing about bar height, by the way, is that people don't always sit at the bar height. Sometimes they stand there. And just having a place to stand or sit if they want to, or stand and sit at a different height dynamic than what's in the rest of the room, again, adds for more flexibility and more possibilities of, of how people can interact around those spaces. If we, and, and for some reason, it seems that the energy level is higher with the people who are working at, at, the, at those more vertical heights for some reason. Uh, and, and there's a lot of interesting things that happen around those spaces that can only happen because we have this, this height variability. The very first time my team met when this uh, space went in, I said, OK, where do you want to meet? And they, they sat down at the couches. There were five of us. So it, was, it made for a nice little meeting. Somebody brought one of the whiteboards over, one of the rolling whiteboards over. And we sat very comfortably and had a very productive meeting. One of the things that, that Kristen mentioned is that we have tons of whiteboards in the room also. There are seven stationary whiteboards, two rolling whiteboards. Um, they're interdispersed amongst the displays all around the room uh, so that people have a place to write on the wall. Uh, HDMI connection to any of, the, any of these areas. We have this, even this table here, it looks like a round table. It is a round table, but it's also divided into semicircles. So you could cut that table in half uh, and, and move that around as well. So I, I guess one of the main things that I, that I want to stress with this space is that there's a very fine line between creating a place where lots of things can happen, happen and creating a space where it looks like certain specific things are supposed to happen. If you make it too specific, then 
it sort of defeats the purpose of creating a space where people can start thinking outside of their normal spaces and, and create new types of workspaces. This was a, a group of students that, that came in one day and they were just sort of um, using this. They, they, they used the separate table layout. Uh, the Clary icon was there and they were doing some stuff with that, but they were also working in teams together. And they were able to work in teams together at the same time that the things were up on that screen. And I believe from the way some of these people are looking over there, the two screens on the other wall were also active with the same thing that was on there. Was that a football game? Or was that just a screen? It's a screen thing. OK. Could have been a football game. We, we thought this went in just before the Super Bowl. And you know, one of the things they wouldn't do what was it like a, I, I had asked, you know, the budget officer for a kegerator? No. So no Super Bowl party. Um, we've, had, we've had a lot of people come in and look at this space. Faculty are coming in and saying, can I bring my class here? And uh, sadly, I can't run regular classes in here because we have lots of development work. But for special occasions like this one, where communication studies students were doing their final projects, they came in the room. It, it, was, it, was, it was a party. Everybody showed up. The students had spaces to, to, to put their, their, their presentations on each of they, they created stations around the room. Uh, the, the, least, the, the interesting thing about this is there was uh, one team was doing an a 3D interactive map of campus. And it was a really, really cool thing. But what they did was they were using the Clary icon, and they set it up like a conference table. And I watched. I didn't do anything except for watch, and I noticed that nobody sat there. And this echoed an experience I, I had at a previous institution when I built a similar type of room. The last place that people want to sit is the place where they think they're expected to sit. So if you have a conference room or, a, or just a, a, a regular traditional type table, but you also have U-shaped bar tables, they're going to sit at the U-shaped bar, U -shaped bar tables first. Then I found they go to the, the cushion seating areas. Then, I'll, then I find they'll, they'll sit at the more semi-formal round table. The last place they'll go is if you set up that main area as a conference room. If you leave it as individual tables, they'll just go and sit there. And this was just the, this was the student presentations again. Not, and we've had instances where you've seen pictures where people are sitting around and working. But in this particular case, nobody's sitting. Everybody's standing. But they're having a great conversation. And, again, and you can see I'd actually, by the, this was that same presentation. I, I'd sort of intervened and moved a couple of tables off. But, but it was too late by then. The, the pattern had already been set and nobody sat there. There was only one place at the, at the head of that Clary icon. They had a, a, a 3D um, headset, and, and, and people were able to interact with what was on the screen. That was the only place people sat in that entire area. Um, this is a work in progress. One of the things that we could not get accomplished, that we tried to get accomplished early on, was there are some really neat things out there. Steelcase makes. These, these, this really neat uh, modular carpeting that has wiring in it so that you can then set up at various points along the way. You, you, can, you can set up little places where people can charge um, anything. They can charge their phones. They can charge their laptops. Uh, we weren't able to get power built into the space, um, which led to another moment where I was unhappy. They found, people found the, the old. Um, th those yellow things you see each have plugs in the end of them and long ugly cords and they basically drape them across the entire room so that they could plug in and I understand the necessity of it and when we can finally get to the point that we can charge through the air I'll be very happy um, or if there, and I'm sure there's other solutions that we're looking at that, that will help us to get to the point where we don't have to be snaking ugly cords across the floor because it just Again, it makes the space look too industrial and too 
Okay. Connected flexibility, we're not quite there yet. We want to be able to do some really interesting lecture capture in the room. Uh, we can do that with the Clary icon, uh, but we're still working on utilizing the how that, the, the interactivity of the Clary icon and how to make that work with lecture capture as well as other things. It is a touch screen. It's a great device, but one of the things that we're still overcoming, and I think one of the, one of the keys to building any space, I can't leave it on that picture. Oops, let me go back. To building any space like this is it has to be intuitive. People see wheels on chairs, they know they can move. People can see, it's, it's very clear that they can, there's a, there's a very clear control on the wall that can move the panels from one place to the other. The Clary icon, once you know that it's a touch screen, it will work like any other touch screen that you have. These are things that are important because you're gonna have people that wanna use this room. And because they see how easy it is. They, they, they see the type of interaction that can take place. But if they get to a point where they're all of a sudden frustrated because they don't know how to do something, it destroys the entire effect. So the, the room has to be laid out very clearly so that there, doesn't, there shouldn't be an instruction manual for running the room. We're still trying to find the best type of um, White, interactive whiteboard overlay for the Clary icon that's easy, simple, and intuitive. I haven't found it yet because the ones that come with it aren't. And if, rule of thumb, if I can't make it work without looking at instructions, then it's not right. So we have to keep looking for things that are going to be easy to use. There should be something that says whiteboard interaction, and then you can just start using it. The, the room, if you're creating a room that's designed for possibilities, you have to allow for possibilities that you haven't thought of. So you have to try to make the room pretty much bulletproof for anything that people want to do in the space. If you create too much specific functionality, you're going to that will also discourage people from, from doing things. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very tight balance between creating a room that can do a lot of stuff and a room that will do a lot of very specific stuff and making sure that the lot of stuff that it can do is easy and intuitive for people to do in an environment that is comfortable, easy to work with, and, and very flexible. Now, um, last thing I wanted to talk about here, this falls under the category of things I wish I'd known about before I designed the room. Uh, this is a, a website called Flexspace. It is a, it, it's a repository for all sorts of cool, interesting design that all sorts of universities are putting together in their learning spaces. Um, and people, it, it's sort of like, um, HGTV for learning spaces where people say, hey, this is, look at the neat thing I did in, in my outdoor barbecue learning room. And uh, so you can go to, you can go to Flexspace and it's, uh, it's a learning environments exchange. And just to try, well, what we did when we started this space, I had, I had started with a room that I had built previously, but then we went online randomly and started looking for learning spaces and things that we found interesting things and, and we worked with that. But this, I think, is a much more organized way to accomplish the same thing. So, am I out of time? If not, I'm done. If you got, unless you have questions. Questions? And we have the mic here, so if you have questions. I don't really have a question, just um, for an overlay. Have you ever heard of the bamboo tablet? Yes. Have you tried that on your TV? No, in fact, I have not, but I've used my iPad. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really neat, very, very simple apps that um, 
uh, you can actually upload uh, a keynote or, or a PowerPoint um, in, in, in some of the interactive apps that you can either get for free or buy for a buck or five. Um, and then it, the whiteboard, so you can walk around the space with your iPad and just like you would be able to the, the Bamboo Interactive and, and just and, and run the stuff that way. Yes, I, I've done that, but one of the things, what I'm trying to accomplish is to be able to, to do that without having to do that. Right. So that the space itself can do that without people having to bring their own things in to make those happen. I see other questions back here or, yeah. Do you want to catch it? Yeah. I think one of the uh, biggest challenges to overcome in space like this is uh, audio. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how you guys overcame a challenge or what, what, what thought went into your audio design in this room? Well, the, it's not a big space. So it doesn't really, for just basic communication, there is, there's no audio necessary. The audio is, is there if, you know, if we're, for things, if we're going to be recording uh, faculty development sessions, things like that, which is part of the space. And you're absolutely right, and we haven't solved that one yet. There's, there's been some um, people have brought in um, potential solutions. Somebody brought, what do they call that thing? A, a, a poly deck or? I'm not sure. Yeah, which again, it looks like if they had these things in the 1950s, that would be what they would bring into the space. It, it, it just, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't match the sensibilities of the room, and so, we are looking at, there's a number of options we're looking at for that. One of the things that I've explored, again, and it may be too much of a bitty solution, have you heard of uh, Swivel? Um, which is a neat little robotic thing about this big that you, again, you, you, you have to use other equipment. You put your iPhone or your iPad or your Android into it and it becomes a, a microphone camera for lecture capture, you wear the, the piece around your neck, which acts as the microphone, also acts as the, uh, the, the it, it tells, yeah. it tells the, the swivel which way to turn. So if you do what I do and just keep walking around, uh, the swivel turns and follows you and records what you're doing. And because you're wearing the microphone, essentially, then you're not going out of range of the sound. But again, that's, it's a limited solution. and. One of the, and that's another area that we need to, to work a little harder at. So we, you know, we've got to look at the area of, of connectivity a little bit more. Power, how do we do that? Audio, you know, these are, these are all things that we're, it, it's still a work in progress and, and we're gonna keep trying to make it better so that in fact, anybody can walk into that space and do whatever they want to do. So I have a question. Um, how do you schedule the space, or how does that happen? Um, I can take that one. We have um, our reservation system at the university is EMS. Um, the room is out there right now. It's being reserved as one big space, but um, down the road, we're kind of thinking of breaking it up into um, two or three different spaces. So if you have a big event, you can reserve all three spaces. Um, if you just want to meet with a small group of people over on the circle table, um, that definitely shouldn't mean that somebody else can't be meeting separately on the bar height table. Um, so we are thinking about splitting those out. We've not done that. It's been kind of re reserved um, as the whole room or just if it's open, people kind of just take it. So is there open times for students then that may want to just use the space? We haven't got that far yet. We're working, you know, there are faculty that have come in and asked to use the space. Uh, someone said, you know, my, I have a class from five to eight, and could I use that on alternate Wednesdays for the semester? Yeah, sure. Uh, but as it gets more into the time where we're planning developments and things like that, um, we have to be a little more um, surgical about how we do that. One of the interesting things that you sort of reminded me of was we have, there, there are different spaces you can work. There are, in fact, in terms of the number of discrete spaces, if you divide into tables, the U-shaped bar, the other table, one, two, about eight discrete spaces that you could work in. And we will have, you know, certain people will come up to me and say, well, how can we do our work here 
if somebody's over at that table doing something. Is it? And, and I sort of try to gently remind people, you know, we have students do that all the time. You know, we have projects going on at various tables. I happen to like working in an environment where there's other buzz and energy going on. One of my favorite places to work is a coffee shop. Not because I care about anything that's going around, but what's going around sort of creates a, 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 a high level white noise or high energy white noise that allows me to, to block that out and concentrate what I, on what I'm doing as opposed to having one small group at, at a table where nobody else is around. People tend to lower their voices. They tend to, 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 to try to, it, it, it lowers the energy level of the room. The question I've got is, how do you measure how successful this environment is and if the areas are being used appropriately for collaborative work? That's a great question. Um, I will uh, I'll tell you at this moment, we don't measure it, um, except in the fact that we're seeing some, I mean, we can measure it sort of informally, qualitatively at the moment. Um, which is to see groups who've been in other environments and how that all works compared to putting that same group in this environment and seeing a whole different level of interaction, a whole different level of productivity. Um, I will tell you that, uh, and this was after the fact that the uh, faculty were, uh, there was a faculty uh, survey that went out and, and talking about the spaces that faculty wanted to have. And basically, what came out was they wanted to have flexible seating, they wanted to have modular furniture, they wanted to have some form of, of smart screen. So we're, you know, we're checking some of these boxes, but I think it's what's important to say is that it's more, it's less about checking the boxes than it is about creating an environment that will work to do an awful lot of things. I think at some point we probably have to to, to think about that question. Uh, I think right now by the, the very act of trying to measure something, we're putting something into a box that I want to keep out of a box at the moment. More questions or comments from? I, just one more for me. Um, the flex space project, so I've learned about that through a consortium I belong to as well. How did you learn about it? And I know you said you wished you had heard about it before, but. Um, last week, an email from Campus Technologies popped into my mailbox and I clicked on the link. <laughs> so that sounds interesting. <laughs> good, it's, it is a very good resource. They're trying to get people, more people to upload their designs in their, uh, flexible spaces in there, and also to know that that is a resource for you as well. So throw that out there. Any other questions, comments for them? Let's give them a, a round of applause. Thank you for being here. And there is a break here. Um, before the next session, and again, next door is um, refreshments and the vendors as you go out this door and to the right. So please stop and visit them, and then we'll have our next session in here and the other rooms as well. Thank you.
Hi, this is a sound check for the transcriptionist, the uh, video captioner. Okay, yeah, we are uh, testing uh, captioning, uh, closed captioning. We're doing a closed caption test. Uh, can you hear me on that side? There we go. I see your captions. Thank you very much.
had to hold it for a little bit. So can you hear me talking now? Anybody? Anybody? Hello? Hello. Ooh, mine's on. <laughs> so are we not going to be able to be close to each other? I don't know. I think mine's just loud. Yours is really loud. Yeah. Better? Still loud. Still loud. Yeah. Hello? 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 That's better. Hello? No? I can kind of hear you. You can kind of hear me? Yeah. If you would like to come up closer here, it's a smaller group and we're still in the large room, please come on up this way. We won't bite, I promise. Um, but I will get this session started. Again, uh, we're live streaming this. So um, we want to field any questions as they finish or as you ask questions of the presenters today through this microphone. So holler at me, those that are um, brave enough to catch it, I'll throw it to you. You can't hurt it. It's the product called the catch box. But um, we'll field those questions through this microphone as well. But so let's uh, get this session started. I'd like to introduce uh, Becky Qualls and Tracy Holzem from Pittsburgh State University. And they will be talking today about help for the help desk and how to structure a student help desk with policies, training, and supervision. So let's welcome them. Thanks. Thank you. OK, welcome to our session. We hope that we can give you guys a lot of good information today. Um, our help desk at the school is called Gorilla Geeks. Um, as you probably know, Pittsburgh State is the only university in the entire world that has a Gus, as, has a gorilla as the mascot, and he was named Gus. And so with that mascot with Gorilla, and of course, naturally, you think IT, you think geeks, it became Gorilla Geeks. Gorilla Geeks has been um, in place for 10 years. This is our 10-year anniversary this year. And it became a need on campus. It was identified as a need when Wi-Fi came to campus. And we had students struggling to be able to get on the Wi-Fi. They were struggling, figuring out how to get, and of course, back then, it was just computers, how to get on that Wi-Fi and be able to use those services. And so we brought that to campus, and 
Ironically enough, as we've been going through the history and putting this presentation together, the same structure that was started is still the same structure that we have. It um, was a good, solid foundation. We've had 10 years of success with Gorilla Geeks, and so we're really happy to be able to share all of this with you today. Okay, like I said, we are called Gorilla Geeks, and here's what we do. The, the first, the main thing that we do, we are help desk support. Um, when Gorilla Geeks first started, it was housed with the rest of OIS, and we had just a couple of students that worked at a time. They sat in a little window area, and students could walk up and ask for help. But as they were there, they found out, hey, there's a whole lot more help we need for campus. We now are in another building on campus, and we have a whole help desk area. Um, we employ 15 students right now at Gorilla Geeks, and um, the biggest thing that we do is help desk for the entire campus. Our kids put in support tickets. They are the go-to for any call-in support, and we have people all the time that walk in with computers. And so let me tell you that when I see people walk in all the time with computers, we have people that are not even associated with campus that walk into our office and want help with their computers because they know we're there and we, they know we do that. We don't do that, however, for people that are not associated with campus. So that's kind of tricky sometimes and uncomfortable for the kids to have to say, you know, you have to be a, a faculty or staff member. But we do service personal computers for faculty, staff, and students. So we will work on those for them as well. So all of that st stuff comes through our help desk in, in the actual office. We also do Gorilla Cards. We inherited um, doing the card process a few years ago. Originally, our cards on campus were with our ticketing system. Our, and, and so the kids would come to campus, they'd get their ID card. But as the years have gone on, and as you all well know, those ID cards on campus now are pretty powerful. They do a lot of things. They're used for their dining dollars, uh, and they can put money on them to use at different places on campus. They use them now. We've, we've just instituted guest print, um, and, and they can go anywhere and print on campus just by swiping their card. And so we create all of those tickets now, which is great, or all of those cards, which is great, because when students first come to campus, first day there, their first, one of their first stops is Gorilla Geeks. And trust me, that's not their last stop. So it's a good thing that they know where we are because they're eventually going to come back and see us again. The kids also do computer repair. And I do say the kids do the computer re repair. In our office, the way we're structured, um, I'm the assistant director for campus services. And so all of the service stuff comes out of our office. We have three campus techs in our office. And they service all of our uh, administrative areas on campus. They do all of the work on their computers. They help them order. They are the go-to people for that. Then we have the 15 kids. Our techs are fantastic because they help our kids, but our kids work on computers. That's one of the things they learn when they come in there. We do diagnostics. We do a lot of diagnostics. And I will tell you, one of the things that we do is that if somebody comes in, first step for our kids is look at it over the counter to see if it's something quick that you can fix. We don't have to take the computer out of the student's hands. We can get it fixed and get them back out the door really quickly. So that's always a first step thing. Um, we will do optimization as well. If the computer's running slow, we can go in and do those things. And of course, number one on our list, of course, is always virus spyware removal. We do tons of that. We have repeat people who come in and say, yeah, I was in here a couple of months ago, and I got a whole bunch more pop-up stuff coming up now. And it's like, OK, we'll take that. Um, we also do operating system installation for students and faculty and staff if they have computers that need that. Uh, we will install software for them if they have it, or we'll assist them with the things that we have on campus. Our kids also do hard drive installs, and they will do backups and recovery. And I do, I wish we'd brought the picture. We have a picture in the back room, and I am not kidding. I'll, I'll put it somewhere where you guys can see it. Somebody, a couple of years ago, brought in a MacBook, and it literally looked like someone had taken that MacBook and crunched it over somebody's head, and it was arced like this and we recover data off that computer. We're still so <laughs> impressed with that that we could do that. Um, but they do do a lot of backups and recovery. And we have a lot of kids that will come in and know that mom's going to buy me a new computer, so hey, could you just pull this stuff off of mine to back it up? Because they know that they have lots of virus spyware stuff going on, and they just want us to get the backups and get that stuff off of there. And then we also have the campus operators in our office. So all calls that come into Pitt State come to our office, and then we route them where they need to be. That actually works out great, because it's really good for our kids to be able to know where things are on campus. And them having to answer that phone and know where to direct people when they're asking for stuff is a great learning experience for them. 
to be able to help. Because I cannot tell you how many times kids stop in our office when they first get to campus needing directions somewhere. And that's the only reason they come in is because they've been to Gorilla Geeks before and they need to know how to get somewhere else or where to go to solve something. So we also have the campus operator. And then we also do technology training. All of the technology training that uh, has to do with our enterprise systems comes out of our office. We do a, a monthly new employee training. When new employees come on campus, that's part of the paperwork they get. We have a continual monthly training that goes on. We go through all of the basic stuff, all of the systems they're going to need to uh, have access to. We make sure that everything's set up well for them. We introduce them to new things that are coming out. I don't know if any of you sat in the, uh, the last session that one of the people from our school did that, uh, about our GUS portal that we have, but that's one of the things that we now include in that monthly training because it just makes it so much easier for people to navigate. So we do all of that. We also do yearly Canvas training for students. Every fall, Tracy and I start splitting up, and by the time we're done, we've, <laughs> we've done about 1,000 to 1,100 students in the new student, uh, in the freshman experience classes, we've done Canvas training, which is our LMS, for them, so that they can get around and get to all of the tips and tricks. They know the basics, because most of these kids are coming from schools where they're already using these sorts of applications. But we show them some tips and tricks and some things that will make their lives easier. We also have Office 365 available to every um, current faculty, staff, and student on campus. And so we do a lot of Office 365 training to let them know the different apps that are available and how they can integrate that into their daily work or how they can integrate it into their classrooms and use that to enhance the stuff that they already have. We also have um, a contract with Adobe, so we do a lot of Adobe Pro training. I don't know if you guys have the new Adobe, it's Adobe DC now. Man, I could kiss the people at Adobe for that. They fixed every bad thing I think that I ever thought about the um, actual PDF uh, creation with this particular rollout. Them and Microsoft have kind of been on a roll the last couple of years with the upgrades they've done. I've been pretty impressed. So, um, so we do a lot of that training as well. We work with our marketing department and our, uh, our web master. He does trainings through our department every month. We organize those for him so that he can keep up people up to date with new enhancements or just to answer questions for them if they're struggling with building their pages on the PSU website. We have a new event system that we just got this year, and it's been challenging. It's a third-party event system, but we, we handle all of that through our office as well. We do all of that training for any users on the system. We've had to create some resources for people to use because it's been a new thing uh, for not only the people that are creating the events, but the users, the people that are signing up. So we, we handle that training. And then, of course, we have a new ERP that's in process right now. We're getting a whole new finance and HR system at um, Pitt, and we will, all of the training will go through our office as well. So here's how we're structured in Gorilla Geeks. Tracy Holzem is our campus services manager, and she is our direct supervisor of all of our students. Uh, we have four Gorilla Geek lead technicians, and these are kids that have been there for a while, um, and they are the ones who we look at, we see leadership in them, and they are first tier support. So they're the ones that like when we have stuff we need to get out to people, we make sure that all of the leads know what's going on. Because then it's their job to make sure that the other 10 or 11 Gorilla Geeks know exactly what's going on. For the Gorilla Geeks, the leads are their first tier question. So if they have a question about, I'm not sure what to do with this, I'm not sure how to handle this, what should I do, they go to the leads first, and then the leads come to anybody else in the office if they're not sure what to do to answer those questions. That's kind of our basic structure as far as hierarchy goes in the office. Um, go ahead, go to the next screen. Um, Tracy, like I said, is our campus services manager. She admins our event system. So she is the person that if people have problems with the event system, they call her um, so that she can look into it or get in touch with somebody who needs to, who could look into it for us. She also assists with technology training, but again, her top job is su supervising our student employees. And I'm going to turn the rest of this over to her because she's going to give you some down and dirty as to what our kids actually do and the processes and the structure that we have in the office. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you first about some general duties of our Gorilla Geeks. Like Becky said, we have 10, 11 right now. We had a couple graduates, so we're in the process of hiring. When we go to the point of hiring, we like to get some incoming freshmen. Because if we can get them when they start young, then we can keep them for all four years, in some cases five. But that way we can get them, get them through the whole process, and by the time they're maybe a sophomore or junior, we can turn them into leads. So for our basic geeks, we call them the geeks, one thing that they do is the operator. We have to have somebody sitting at the operator from 8 o'clock in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. That is never not an option. If somebody's not there, 
a lot of times, Becky and I cover. We have times in our day where kids will go to class, four kids come, and there's one person there. One person has to be sitting at the desk. Becky and I jump up. We go sit at the operator station. Somebody has to be answering that phone. So that is something that there's somebody there all day long. When you look at that, by the time the kids can only work 20 hours a week, that's about two and a half kids in a week. So that helps give them a job also. So that's nice for them. They create gorilla cards. That's a big part of what we do. Pit Cares is getting ready to come up where all our new freshmen are gonna come on campus. We'll have 120 kids a day coming through getting gorilla cards. So you can imagine what our office looks like is we have the 120 kids plus two and three parents each, everybody asking a different question. They all went in, they all went out. So we can get them out. We're down to about two and a half hours now. So we're really proud of that. We've kind of come up with a process that works to get them in and out. We have about five or six kids doing that. Still somebody man in the phone, somebody man in the operator phone. So we have people really stretched on those days. And again, on those days, part of what makes our office work, the phone's ringing, only one person to answer it. Becky and I jump up, we're answering the phone. We're helping check IDs. We're doing a lot of things on those days. Account support, this is the biggest thing that we do in our office. I can't tell you how many calls we get every day and how many passwords we reset. Our best phone call was the other day. We had a 50-year-old lady trying to call and reset her 18-year-old son's password. So you can imagine our kids when they're answering the call and this mother's trying to reset her son's password. You guys all know FERPA rules. We can't do that. And so that was an interesting phone call. We're just like, I don't think your name is George. So that was an interesting phone call with the kids. Actually, that whole story is <laughs> she called and said, I need to reset my son's password. And so the kids do what they always do. They said, you know, ma'am, according to purple laws, we can't do that. We have to talk to your son. Just have him call us back. And she said, okay. And she calls right back. And the, the boy that answered the phone, he came in, he goes, this is not a kid. This is an old <laughs> woman on the phone. And it was a boy, no less. His name was Garrett. And so I said, he said, she, she didn't know part of the information that she needed. So he said, I'm afraid she's going to call back. I said, we'll talk to her. Don't worry. <laughs> so we instantly get some uh, funny phone calls from the kids. Canvas is again our LMS. The students will come in and a lot of time have questions, troubles, little things as easy as I can't get my PowerPoint to attach, how do I do that? Without Google, I don't know how our geeks would run the front desk. I don't know how many times a day they Google questions that people will call and have, questions they have. So that is a big thing that people come in for. Our computer repair and check-in, we always try to fix it over the counter. Anything we can do over the counter, we do not charge people for. So that's instantly the first thing that we're going to try. We have them give them as much details as they can so that we know what's going on with the computer. Maybe we can try to fix it real quick. Probably about 75% of the time we can't fix it, and we do have to check it in. And then that's when our process starts that we start working on it. But that is something that we always try to do is to help the kids over the counter, get them in and out and on their way as soon as we can. Device support. We help them connect all their different apps to their phone. We do this a lot with faculty. We, as faculty and staff, we struggle a little bit getting our email on our phone sometimes, or you get locked out because of a password or a password change. We change it on our computer, and we forget to change it on our phones, and we get locked out. So this is a big part of what the kids do is helping. So you can tell that these kids really need to be good at customer service. Because when you guys know, when our phones don't work and we go in, we're not the nicest or the happiest people. We want it done. We want you to fix it. So these guys have to talk it, talk it over with them, smooth it over, make things good for them. Our ticketing support system, we talked about that earlier. And that's where people can send that in online. They can do it through our email, or they can also call us. And then we'll create tickets for them. So once a ticket's started, our job is the middleman. So we may have to assign it to a programmer or developer to fix, but we're really going to be the person that they're going to call back and ask how that's going. We have to call the programmer or developer, say, hey, do we have any information we can tell them? So we're the kind of go-between person. So we're the person they contact when they still have questions on that, and then we follow up when the developers or programmers have finished that. And then software support, any of our campus enterprise systems, we help with that across campus too. The biggest thing we probably do is help them download um, Office 365. So our geeks have a little bit more. They get more pay being a lead. So once you move up to a lead, we currently have four of those right now, you do get a, lot more, a little bit more pay because you have more responsibilities. One of the things you have to do is you have to do a fiduciary check because you do make deposits and run transactions. So if you haven't passed that check, you can't do those things. And that's a big deal every day because come 3 o'clock, we have to have it by 3.30. 
you have to remember to get that done. We didn't have a lead the other day and Becky and I were sitting there trying to figure it out because we don't have to do it very often. But that is a big deal of running money and knowing that you can trust those kids for that many. There's a separate ticketing system for our developers, which we use Team Dynamics. And so mostly just our leads work in that. Any of our geeks can put in a ticket, but our leads are the ones that follow up in Team Dynamics and update our ticket to make sure everything is current with that. So that is something that leads are expected. Because we feel like they've been there longer, we have a little more trust in them and maybe a little more faith because they've worked on computers longer. So for instance, if we need to order a hard drive, a geek can look up the hard drive and see if that's the hard drive they think. A lead always has to go back and double check it because we're asking you to spend money to fix your computer. We want to make sure we're telling them the right part. So we have one person look it up. We have a lead come back and follow up and make sure that is the right part. We have found several times where they've looked up the wrong part. It's just a simple mistake. But because the leads, some of them have done it for two and three years, they know a little bit more about it. So we feel a little bit more confident if we're asking somebody to spend money that we're giving them the right part to buy. They assist with the creation of process materials. That's something new that we have been working on in the past year is we want to get some of our processes down and get them on paper because we do have several kids that are graduating. And so the new ones coming in, they have a checklist of some things they can check. For instance, if they're running virus off, uh, trying to get viruses off a computer, they have a checklist of things they can go through. That checklist won't work every time, but it's a good place to start and a good place to end. And it just helps a person who's trying to learn to have something to look at to try to follow. The nice thing about those processes, we are constantly updating them. We are changing them because something's changed, somebody noticed something that didn't work. We have a really good team in our office. And I think that's part of what makes us work so well is because we do work like a team. Somebody doesn't take it personal if they've got something wrong on here and you're like, hey, this step needs to go before that. And they're like, oh my gosh, thanks for catching it. I think that is why we work so good together because we can all take that, not necessarily criticism, but we can take that and learn from it and move on from there. Um, assigned duties to geeks. Sometimes our geeks come in and they get maybe talking to somebody or doing something else. The leads are the ones that keep them on track. They're saying, hey guys, we need to get in Paratrue and we need to call on some tickets. Did somebody check the voicemail? Will somebody go do this? Will somebody empty this? You're, we're constantly asking the different geeks to do things and so we kind of put our leads in charge of that so that that's not something that Becky and I have to be there to do all the time. Uh, the first contact for the geek questions. So if a geek has a question, somebody calls, they're not sure what to do, our leads are going to be the first person that they go talk to. If the leads can't figure it out, then they come to Becky or I, Colton, we've got other people in the office, one of our techs. But we like them to make that initial contact with our lead first so that maybe their le our leads can help them figure out the problems. And then our new geek training, we have a checklist. I think, did we pull That's up our checklist? We pulled one up to show you guys we actually have this that the kids go through. They get this on the first day that they start. And this is the checklist that all the geeks will have to go through when they initially get hired. And some things are some really simple things, but some things are really some important things. For instance, timesheet. We try to show you how to fill that out and do that on the very first day that you come so that when two weeks later it's time for payday, you've already done those and you know how to do them. You guys know, like the rest of us do, we want to be sure and get paid. But those are just some simple things. The transferring calls to voicemail, we do that all day long. Once somebody's seen that you know how to do that, they sign off on it, you go through this whole checklist. Once you do all this checklist, we have little incentive things that we do. You get a candy bar, you get a bag of chips, something to show that you went through this process and you learned this process like everybody else did. Did I hit all those? Okay. Next thing we want to talk to you about is scheduling. Our office works. We have different hours throughout the year. When school's in session, we work Monday through Friday, 7.45 to 6 o'clock. The first couple weeks of the year, we always try to stay open until about 7. Last year when school started, I think we had 15, 20 computers in the first week of school. Two years ago when school started, we had 30 computers sitting in there when school started. So we need those extra hours in the night to get some of that time done, some of that work done. We keep at least two kids after 4.30, and if they're not getting phone calls and they can work on computers for two and a half hours, they can get quite a bit of stuff done. So we really try when school starts to be open a little bit later. Plus, we have a lot more walk-in traffic when school starts. 
somebody needs an ID card, somebody needs to put money on their banana bucks. We see a lot more of that. So we try to be more flexible when school starts. Then we go back down to 6 o'clock, and we find, have found that that works really good. On Fridays, we close at 4.30. All of campus leaves at 4.30, and we figure by that time everybody's done for the weekend and they're going home. We do keep hours in the library on Sunday. We work from 3 to 6 in the library and have a geek there. They will answer phone calls. You can come in and get help, any of those things, and they'll help you out in there. We found that we're not really busy there, but we get one or two phone calls, and the one or two phone calls that we get are people that really need help, so we have found that that time is beneficial. During breaks, we are open from um, 8 to 4.30. So like during Christmas break, if on the out days that we are working, we do just do 8 to 4.30. We don't stay after that. We don't have kids coming in after 4.30. And then right now, we're actually on summer hours. So our summer hours are 8 to 4.30 Monday through Thursday, and then 8 to noon on Friday. And again, somebody has to be there to do the operator phone during all of those times. So that keeps somebody busy there also. I brought some documents for you to look at. These are things that we send out to the kids so that we know how to schedule them and when they have class. So we send this out to them, we share it, we do this through their Gmail, and we share this with them. And so we have their names on the left, and they have to go through and they have to mark different things. We tell them, if it possible, to avoid the gray of when you prefer not to work because we really need to know when you're in class and when you're not in class. We're pretty flexible on our times, and I feel like we do a good job working with the kids, but when we need somebody, we need somebody. So obviously the yellow is when they don't have class, and those are times they can work. It's nice to avoid the little one-hour times that they work, but sometimes that's kind of hard. It is very convenient for the students, because if they have a class from 8 to 9, and then they have a class from 10 to 11, they like to be able to come and work from 9 to 10. That would be great, except it's really 9 to 9.45 by the time they leave and walk across campus, and sometimes they don't get there till 5 after 9. So those hours aren't all re always really valuable, but sometimes we do need them in those times, so we'll bring them in. We like the longer stretches, and then the black is the time that they're in class. So we have them do this. We ask them to do this, and it's due like two weeks after they enroll. And that way, it gives us enough time to build the schedule in. We understand that things change. People need off, things like that. Our geeks are really flexible. They have my cell phone number. They have Becky's cell phone number. We say, text us if you know you're going to be late, even if it's going to be five minutes. Because if there's only two people there and you're five minutes late, so there's one person there, we kind of need to know that. So information like that is really important. But this is what we send to the kids, and then we build the schedule off of that. I did bring a sample schedule just so that you can see. And again, these change throughout the year because sometimes people drop classes. Sometimes we have somebody have to get another job for some reason and things just change. But we try to not have really more than five people working at once. There are times where there are more than five and there's a lot of times when there's less than five. Our top line is always the operator and we have to have that filled all the way across. I think this is actually one that we had to revise. And then we break out our leads and put our leads at the bottom. Our goal is to have a lead all day, every day. There is times there's not a lead, so that means I have to do a deposit or I have to run a transaction or Becky has to do that. And those things happen, but we try our best not to make that happen. But sometimes just based on the kids' schedule, if they have class, they have class. So we do have to work around that sometimes. Most of the times it works out pretty good. We get to a point where we get to a hiring process, and one of the first questions we ask is, what is your schedule? If they know it and the times they're available is not when we need them, that has stopped us from hiring kids before because it doesn't help us at a time where we already have six kids working if that's the only time they can ever work. So that does make or break sometimes a good kid. We had a girl that is now one of our leads that we hired her a year later than when we wanted to because she didn't have the time available. Even though she's good, if she can't help us in the times we need, she's really not helpful. So those are some decisions that you have to look at and some of those decisions that you have to make. What did you do to put that back? So those are things. Um, also, so I don't forget, we actually have paper up here. If you guys want copies of all these, we can share our SharePoint with you guys. So that is something that before you leave, we can have you put your email addresses down, and we can share all this information with you also. So our hiring, I talked a little bit about that. The first thing is we evaluate a need. We had two kids graduate, one being a lead, one just being a regular geek. So that told us right away we needed to look at a couple things. First, we had to decide who are we going to move up. The way we work our leads is everybody works an evening shift. That way there's always somebody there to take money. 
So they have to have evenings available. They have to be somebody who's responsible. They have to be somebody who comes in, does their work, doesn't have to be asked every day to do their work. You guys know that's really important. You can have a great kid who comes and sits down and watches videos all day and they're not helping you. You need somebody who's a self-starter. So we had to look at those two things. Um, then we go to the student center and we have something called Gorillas for Hire. At Gorillas for Hire, they send out postings to students and say that we're looking to hire. If we're hiring, we have to post with them once a semester. Once we post it at the beginning of the semester, we don't have to post again for the rest of the semester. <coughs> Excuse me. So people can bring in resumes to us, they can hand them to us. We tell the kids, tell your friends, if you know somebody, you know, have them bring them in. But we do go for Gorillas for Hire. Then we do an interview process. We ask them to print their schedule. It's kind of turned into a little test. We had one kid that we thought was going to be pretty good, and we're like, hey, will you print your schedule out for us? And they were a sophomore, and they're like, how, how do I print my schedule out? And we're like, well, they're probably not very friendly in Gus if they don't know how to print their schedule out. So that was kind of a test we didn't even realize was a test until they failed it. Then we have our leads come in. We do ask our leads to come in and ask some questions. One thing we like to remind our leads is you guys sat in that other seat. Don't ask questions you wouldn't be able to have answered at that time. They like to ask them, how much computer knowledge do you have? Do you feel comfortable taking a computer apart? Are you afraid to Google things? I think that's their favorite question to ask them is, what would you do if you didn't know how to solve a problem? They're always looking for them to say, Google. That's what we all do. One and of then, the nice things about having the, the leads involved in our <coughs> interviews is that a lot of times they know exactly what we need in the office. They know that we are light on the technology side, that we don't have kids that are as versed in, in our computer repair as we do at, on, on customer service. And so they're very good at looking at and identifying the exact needs that we actually have. And they really have had some really good insight. But the most telling thing has been them making the statement this is hard. Interviewing and hiring is hard. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it is. And so it's been a great learning experience for them as well. And it's been an ownership. And like Becky said earlier, the kids are the ones that work on the computers. They know the questions to ask. If Becky and I had to go back and work on a computer, we could probably do it. It would take a long time, but they do it every day. And they know what they're looking for. We don't know on that side what we're looking for, what we're looking for but they do know that. And then we also use references on campus. Um, we use Skype a lot on campus. We actually have one of our inst um, instructors. He works in our information services and is a part-time instructor. He's a great reference for us because he's had a lot of these kids in his information services classes. So he can send kids our way. He can tell us how they're doing in class. We can call other people on campus. So it is nice to have the different people on campus that we can call and ask those questions to. So when we train our new geeks, our leads do all the training. We have our leads do the training because we feel like they're the ones that are kind of running the office. You know, if we're not there and somebody has a question, they're the ones that need to be given this information. They obviously, hopefully, have been there the longest. They know the best way to do things. They know our processes. So we like them to do them. There's times that's not possible. For instance, we've got two leads on vacation this week. We have a new kid that started. We need other people to step up and do that. But overall, we like for our leads to be the ones that do that. I showed you the checklist that we had. That is a process that they all go through to answer the questions, know the things they have. We have them fill paperwork out, simple things like when's your birth date, because if everybody doesn't have a Becky in your office, you need a Becky in your office. If it's your birthday, you get a birthday treat. And by birthday treat, she says, what do you want? And she makes it. So of course, knowing when your birthday is very important. <coughs> we have our different policies that we go through and that's part of what they sign off on. Those are things that are changing as we go because we're learning new things that work, better ways to do things, so that is something new. And then we try to do meetings with them. The way we do our meetings is we have our meetings with our leads first. We talk to our leads, we talk to them to get an agenda for our meeting. What is it you want to talk about? Because you know they all see different things that we don't always see, so they bring different things to the table. They get their chance to talk just like everybody else. Our feeling about the leads meeting is what happens in the lead meeting stays in the lead meeting. If they're having an issue with somebody, then it becomes the issue Becky and I are having with them, and then we have the issue with them instead of the kids having it. So we step in and take that part over for them. When they're seeing it, we can fix it for them. So they come, they sit down with us first, we decide the things we need to talk about, then we bring everybody in as a group. 
We try to do that twice a year. We do it at 7 o'clock in the morning. The kids grumble about it. Becky makes them breakfast. They're a little bit happier then. But we feel like there's things that we need everybody together so everybody is hearing the exact same thing. And so that is why we do that two times a year. And they really don't grumble too much about it. I will tell you one thing that came out of um, when we started doing the regular lead meetings. Um, one thing that happens is they will see and hear. The kids will talk to each other and say, you know, well, so-and-so's doing this or so-and-so's doing that. But one of the most interesting things that came out of lead meeting was we had um, a non-traditional student in our office, great computer tech. I mean, he, this kid knew his stuff. I say kid, he wasn't that much younger than I am. Um, so I guess I'm a kid. But um, he knew his computer stuff. I mean, he really knew what he was doing. It would have been great if we could have got him there every day he was supposed to be there. He was one of those kids, gone all the time. Always sick, something was going on, mom's got problems, and a lot of it was legitimate. He, re they, he really was. There was stuff going on. But he just wasn't what I would call real work brittle. The kids begging me, don't fire him, don't fire him. I mean, really rallied and wanted to keep him because they really liked him. We all really liked him. We would have liked him to be there all the time, but we all really liked him. And so I asked him, hey, okay, so here's our policy. You guys are telling me everybody else is mad because he's gone all the time and it's hurting morale. We all know he's a great kid. We know he's, he's really good at what he does. What do you want to do? And their response was, we want to talk to him. And they had a meeting with this kid, Tracy and I were there, and they told him, hey, Anything we can do to help you, we don't want you to not be here. We want to be able to help you. If you need anything, you come to us. And you talk about a great community moment in, for our office because they really rallied around. Now, I would love to say that it worked out. It did not. He did not stay, and it ended up being his choosing. But I think it, that was a really great thing, not only of the kids. It was a, really grow, a real growth moment for them because they really worked hard to try to keep him in the office and try to keep the whole atmosphere that everybody else was so um, frustrated with at bay and then help this kid as much as they could. So it was a, it's been a really good thing our meetings have been. Mm -hmm. So I guess we've kind of talked about that, our different lead ones in our full meetings and then our new processes and technology meetings. We actually have some different committees on campus. For instance, we now have a guest portal and we have a guest app. And so we take our geeks, some of our overachieving geeks, and we like to put them on those different technology groups also. They're not just with Becky and I, they're with other people across camp campus. We have a Crimson Club that actually meets with the president and they do that once a month. One of our geeks is on that. They know that if we're going to recommend somebody to it, they're going to be worth their time. So that says a lot about us, it says a lot about them. But people do come to us across campus asking for our kids to be on different groups. And so that does really make us feel good that people are looking to us because they know how hard our kids work and how much our kids do do. So that does make it really nice for them. And besides us having lead meetings and the full group meetings with our geeks, anytime we have something new, like our portal, if you were at the last session, um, our developers come over. They come over and they walk the kids through the process. They show them exactly. And here's one of the really nice things. Our developers have a lot of respect for our kids and they treat them that way because they'll come over and say, here's what this will do. What do you guys need to help you assist the customers? And they put, I told John, I said, sometimes, buddy, you're giving us way too much power over here because of the access he's given us to be able to do things for people. But they're very good about that and they really want the kids to know. So they're, they're great about coming over and having meetings with the kids to fill them in on all of the new developments that are going on across campus. So this is a big deal for us, is communication. How do we get the kids to read and to hear and to see what we have out there? We have several different things that we've tried. Of course, we have email, but we got to make them check their email. They're supposed to come in every day when they get to work and check their email. That doesn't always happen, but we try to communicate everything through there. Any work schedules that we have, any timesheets that go out, all of those go out through email. We also have Yammer that we've tried incorporating. I think it works better on the adult side than on the student side. The students don't want to take the time to read it. They feel like it's one more thing. But we're pushing them and pushing them to get out there and try it. So we post stuff on Yammer. If we have new procedures, that's a good place to put it. For birthdays, you know, anything to get the kids out there to look at it. We try to post all that information on Yammer also. Skype is a big thing that we use, and we use that across campus. We're not in the same building as the rest of our department. 
So Skype is a perfect tool for us to be able to talk to them because you guys know that sometimes you're in a meeting and you can email or you can Skype, but you can't get up and answer a phone call. We have great people across campus that will be on their Skype and will answer us that way. So we can have a person on hold, we can have them fix that problem and we can get back to that person and we never had to call them. So Skype is a big thing that we use. We use it in our office. It's easy to do it for the kids to be sitting in the lead cubicle. If they have a question for me or a question for Becky and they know that we're in the middle of something, they know that they can Skype us and get a hold of us that way too. So we do use Skype a lot. We have a SharePoint that we use that we put all of our documents on. And that makes it nice for the kids because if Becky or I is out and they need to get to those documents, they know that they're all on the SharePoint. We've shared that with all of them and it's an easy way for them to get to it. There's processes that they're updating. Those are all on our SharePoint. That way if somebody can't find the copy that's in the back, they know they can get on our SharePoint, they can print a new one, and they have that information right there at their fingertips. Something new the kids wanted to introduce was GroupMe. I don't know if any of you guys have used it. It's an app on the phone. Becky hates it. It's like mass texting, <laughs> and I hate it. But they love it, so we use it. And GroupMe is what we have found works best with the kids. Again, it was their idea was the GroupMe. That's the one that they said they're going to look at the most. It's as close to texting probably is what we have, but that is our best form of communication with them. While we don't like it the best, we know if we want them all to read it, that's going to be our easiest place to post it to get them all to read it. We have a support website, um, Gorilla Geeks at Pitt State, and this is where we have a knowledge base. So sometimes people need more information than what maybe we can give them at the help desk, or maybe sometimes people want to read it and don't have time to talk to us. We can point them to our knowledge base, and it has up-to-date information and instructions of how they can do something. Maybe they can't get over to have us look at their phone, but they could get online and look at it, and they'd rather walk through it online. That's a process that we do, so that way we want to get as much information as we can out there to campus so that anybody that needs that information can get it. So we do point people to our knowledge base a lot. It does have a frequently asked questions section so that maybe if they're having an issue, they can see some of the issues some of the other people have had and ways to fix that. Because we're not 24-7, you saw our hours, so there's times on the weekends that we can't help them. So this is another place that they can go during those times to maybe find that answer. And then they can also submit a ticket. So if they can't get what they need decided or fixed then, they can submit our ticket through our support website also. The last thing we want to talk to you guys about is some things that we're trying to get developed now. And some of them are already, we're already started using them, but it's all new things. And the first thing is evaluations. Right now our kids do not have a formal evaluation. Um, one of the things that we've been very active in is trying to help our kids um, find internships and things like that because we're connected with people who and, and industries that, that use those types of things. And we got to thinking about all the things we're trying to do with these kids to show them what the real world is like, like letting the leads sit in on, inter on, on, on the interview process. And one of the things that they'll have to do no matter where they go is an evaluation. So we are going to develop evaluations for our students so that they can sit through those. We're going to try to do those every semester. And there's basically going to be a couple of categories, customer service and technology and work skills. Um, and we have, we've already developed a rubric that we're going to start with. Uh, it's a work in process or in progress, but we're going to keep doing that. And one of their evaluations will be scheduled every year around their annual raise. Um, the way it works, if you have student employees on campus, on our campus, they automatically get the raise every year unless we say no. So um, it's just an automatic thing, which is nice. We don't really have to worry about it as long as our kids are doing well. But this will help them to know, hey, it's time for your raise. We're going to do this evaluation. And then, we, like Tracy mentioned earlier, we've already started our incentives. And by the way, our incentives was our leads idea. They were the ones that wanted to institute the incentives. And they have the ability to give them out. And they, it's really funny because we tell them they know where all the stuff is and they can just do it. But every time they want to give one, they come and ask Tracy and I. So and so is doing a really good job. Can I give him a candy bar? Yeah, give him a candy bar. Um, but we've already started that. Um, the other is internships. And we actually had an, a graphics, one of our graphics students did his internship with us this semester in our office, which was great because we have the new ERP and he got to develop a whole bunch of new logos for all this new stuff that we have. And he did a great job. Um, and so that was one of the things. The funny thing was we also had our programmers were setting up an internship this summer for one of our geeks who unfortunately 
for them, I just hired full time in my office as a tech. So he doesn't get to do his internship with them, but they're working on that as well. And then um, our systems team this summer is doing upgrades, and they were looking for somebody. So our office has our, a actually started looking at a whole, a whole lot of ways to actually do internships uh, for students. Um, and then our processes are, are continual work. We are always reevaluating those. And I can tell you, I said that Gorilla Geeks was started with a great foundation. Barbara Herbert started this 10 years ago. She's still with us. Um, and she did a great job building this because the only things that we've redone are the processes. We've added new, new um, uh, services, but the only things we continue to do are the processes as things change. And that will be a constant, as you guys know. You're always reevaluating uh, your processes. But then the last thing is we want to start a leadership academy. Uh, whenever it comes time to, to put new leads in, we always wonder, okay, what's the criteria? First thing we always look at is who's been here, but as you well know, um, length of, of time of service is not always necessarily an indication of leadership. And so we already have kids who serve in leadership positions all over campus. But we want, we're going to have our leads be part of this, but any geek who is interested in eventually becoming a lead will ask them to join as well. And we'll do brainstorming sessions and they'll be able to do problem solving activities and leadership readings. And we do have these other groups across, across campus who are always looking for kids to participate. I think we have something like four different committees committees that we're always asked, do you guys have kids that could be on these? Um, our ITC committee is one of those, and we always have a student representative on ITC. So uh, that's one of the things that our Leadership Academy will do as well. Um, let's see. So before I take questions, let me say this. Some of the stuff we've shown you, we have all of that available. We've got it on a SharePoint in a folder. We would love to share that stuff with you. It's all either in Word or Excel format, and so you can take it and do whatever you want to with it if you're interested in any of those documents. There's a whole lot more in there than what we've just shown you. We actually have part of our, um, uh, our handbook that has a lot of our policies in it um, and things like that in there. So if you guys want that, before you get out of here, if you'll just come up here and give us your email address, we'll be happy to share that folder with you that has all of those resources in there. And don't be surprised if we share it with you and you get in there one day and say, hey, there's new stuff in here because as we keep <laughs> developing stuff, we want to keep uh, sharing that with people who want to have you know, an effective help desk. Does anybody have any questions? Questions from the audience? Um, back there. Okay. Okay, I really don't have a question. I just wanted to catch the box. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, do your, as an operator, do your folks have to try to know everything about campus, everything that's going on? And, um, they, usually they do, because we do have a lot of people who will call. One of the very first things, we have a new, if you guys don't know this, I, I don't know how nobody knows this, but we have a new performing arts center that we, that opened uh, last year, and um, that was one of the first things. I mean, plastered all over the operator's desk was how to get out there for tickets and all of this stuff. So yeah, we do try to keep them up to date on big things that are going on on campus. Our kids are really good. Our operators have gotten really good about doing this because we can all hear where they're sitting and they'll say, oh, you're interested in the track meet? Let me see where that's at. And they say it loud enough so that someone in the office says, they're out at the Plaster Center so that they can tell them really quickly. So yes, we do try to keep them up to date on what's going on. You, you put stuff on Yammer for that, and, but they don't change. Not usually, <laughs> because most of the time that's such an instantaneous thing. But one of the nice things we have, we have such a cross-section of kids in our office. We do not have a lot of technology uh, majors in our office. We have all kinds of majors in our office. And they're involved in so many things that that in and of itself has kind of helped to generate the fact that they know a lot of what's going on because we have such a wide variety. Yep. Okay, do, I have one more question. Do you have... Um, a system in place when, like after hours, when they take, they take a call and they can't answer that? Yes. Who do they? Do they it, most of the time, there are some things that they know that there are questions we can't answer. They have a process, and by the way, we do have some of our processes in this folder so you guys can see those, what they look like. Um, but they, we have a certain process, and there are times when they get to a certain point, they know the only answer is to put a ticket in. But I will tell you this, I've gotten a lot of 7 o'clock phone calls before. So um, <laughs> they know that they can call me, they can call Tracy, they can call, they, they have the developer's phone numbers, they have, they have all of our leadership team in OIS, they have our phone numbers available to them. So they do have, and I always know if I look at my phone and it's that phone number from Pitt State, it's a problem, I need to answer <laughs> that right now. And everybody pretty much knows that. So, so they do have that process, they know that's a last in thing or emergency, but yes, they, they do know they can do that. I also had a question about um, that you take 
like student computers and you help with a problem that they might have on that computer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is the extent of how much will you do and, and do you charge for that? We don't do we don't do basically hardware things. Now we'll replace hard drives. We don't order any parts. So if they do need like a hard drive replaced, that's what we were talking about earlier. The leads will research that for the client and say, here's a good one, and they'll make a suggestion. And if they want to order it and bring us the part, then we'll replace that hard drive. But we don't do screen repair or anything like that. We don't do anything like that. We have a lot of people in town that do, and we hand those cards out all the time. Um, but right now, the most expensive process we have is $35. And that's our biggie. That's like yeah. the whole the OS, OS install. install and all this stuff. Um, but we're looking at upping those prices just a little bit because those prices also haven't changed in 10 years. The <laughs> when I tell you our foundation prices. was 10 years ago, uh, everything was from 10 years ago. <laughs> so uh, we're looking at upping those, but we're not going to up it a lot because we still want to make it affordable to students. So I'm going to take one more question back here because um, we're a little bit out of time. Okay. But after that, if you want have other questions, maybe you can take card or sure. ask them. I just want to be able to get the next folks in here. So let's see who had their hands raised. So, um, how do you situate your lead students so that they are available for your other consultants to have as a resource? When people walk in our office right now, you walk in and you're at the help desk. It's just right there as you come in. But at the, they, the kids walk around to sit behind it, and if they go to the end of that, there's a little cubicle at the end of it, and that's where the leads sit. So they are right there, right next to those, those people that are at the help desk. And one thing our leads know is if there's three people there, they can sit there. If there's two people there, they sit out front just like yeah. everybody else. Like, just like Becky and I will answer the phones if they ring. The leads are no different than that. And so we always make everybody aware of that so they know that. When you talked, to, when you talked about the charges, is that for non-university um, owned yes. devices? That's yes. just for oh, personal yeah, yeah, devices? Yeah. Anything the university owns, there's no charge for. And do you go ahead and fix those, or do you send those to a tech room, a, they a, go to a university techs. tech? Yeah. yeah. They, I couldn't hear you. The, the techs take the care techs of their areas. Those. OK, yeah. thank you. Is there one more at this table? I'm sorry. OK, we're going to go ahead and finish these. <laughs> I was just wondering how it's funded overall. Is it from these fees? We have one person in our, in our office who, from the card fees, the students, of course, pay a fee every year for their, I mean, you, in, in, in fees, there's a fee for the card. One person in our office, the salary is, it comes from, part of his salary comes from those fees. Um, but otherwise, we're just part of OIS. So while the money comes in, it's just part of the, the whole OIS budget that pays for this. All right, Let, lots of questions. Thank you all. Let's thank Tracy and Becky. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Don't forget to give us your email if you want us to share that folder with you. Thank you.
this uh, session for today. If there's some of you in the back, if you're, you're welcome to come up here closer if you would like. If you want to stay back there, I might uh, toss this at you if you have a question. No, no. Um, but let's get started right today. Um, I would like to introduce John Godfrey and Anurag Patel. And they are here to present their session on super chicken pot pie, a recipe for help desk KPIs. I think there was a little bit longer name on our schedule, but... Um, we truncated it. You truncated it. So um, as we get started here again, towards the end, we'll ask questions through this, so look for that. And welcome, and please get us started about your KPIs. Thank you so much, Brenda. Welcome, everyone. My name is John Godfrey. Um, I'm the uh, Director of Information Security and Customer Support at KU Med. And I'm Anurag Patel, and I'm the Director of Strategy for Information Security and Customer Support. So we will go ahead and jump right in. So are you a super chicken? Anyone? No one? Maybe? OK, well, let's find out. So the super chicken model is actually a very interesting concept based on a TED Talk. Um, you're all familiar with TED Talks, right? So free talks, they're excellent resources for learning. Um, we will share resources about this particular TED Talk at the end if you're interested. And so we started with this TED Talk. It's about a 15 minute talk, and it walks through some concepts about how most organizations work. Specifically, how do we take employees, how do we promote employees, and what does that path of reward look like within an organization? And there was some really interesting research done based on chickens, mainly because chickens are easy to study. They cluck, they eat, and they lay eggs. Um, and so this research started with chickens, and they took the chickens that laid the most eggs, the super performing chickens. And then they took them away, and they put them with some more super performing chickens, and so forth and so forth. And eventually, all we had was a collection of super performing chickens. And what do you think happened to those super performing chickens? There we go. They ended up kind of trampling, pecking, you know, whatever they do with their beak to each other. If you've ever been into one of those farm stores and you see little chickens get destroyed, kind of like that. And so ironically, that's kind of what happens in an organization, right? So we reward the top performers. As they go up in the organization, we eventually start developing the super chickens in the organization. And so success is achieved by picking the superstars. We give superstars all the resources and the power in the organization. And eventually, the result has always been aggression, dysfunction, and ultimately waste. So we end up squashing you like a bug. So we've heard of kind of the alpha, alpha concept, you know, alpha male, alpha female, whatever concept in an organization. That's really kind of the super chicken concept in an organization. So we've taken this concept and we've started to apply it. And this is where we started from when we started this analysis. It, the team that we inherited was engineered for the individual versus the team. We had silos and perpetuated divisions between the various functional units of the team. Does anyone have those in their organization? No. Okay, good, I'm glad you don't. Um, mistrust and rampant backstabbing, or the better one, throwing your coworker under the bus. You know, that's always fun. Um, just hope it's not you. And then we had a problem. There was poor measurement of what was meaningful and relevant. So how did we fix all that? We focused on three things. First, part of the problem stemmed from the quantity-based metrics that were being used. Second, what about customer satisfaction? Do we care about that? Hopefully. And lastly, employee satisfaction. That's something that is kind of novel. That's, a, that's an area that some places don't even focus on. And that's an area that we wanted to focus on. So hopefully, we can solve the error. So before we go to where we, what we fix, Let's go back to what we were measuring. We were doing a lot of things that a lot of other help desks do, measuring the things that don't matter. Um, we were measuring the number of tickets closed, the time to resolution, average wait calls, et cetera, et cetera. All of these little pieces that were gameable. 
and it was quite evident in our desk as well. We could figure out ways to get someone off the phone. We could figure out ways to um, see how many number of tickets we could create out of one incident so that we would just have more tickets available. It's easily gameable. Um, after the initial making sure that a customer isn't waiting too long, fixing their incident, et cetera, et cetera, there was a lot of effort created to actually get very little customer satisfaction, little employee satisfaction back. So not only were we driving the wrong responses, we were wasting a lot of resources in areas that we didn't need to. Um, so when it came to recording, the one thing that's most important on our desk, customer satisfaction, we were also not doing it very well. Um, there's a lot of stats up here. The one that I want you guys to focus on first is our return rate. We had awesome scores, but they were at less than 1% return rates. They weren't statistically significant. So to give you an idea of what that means, I'll flip back to this, but I'll, I'll show you guys a, a, just a graph. To get the first level of statistical significance, we had an error of margin that would lie outside the realm of possibility. And that's based on our size of population. So the next level, which I'll go back to, which would be um, the next one down, would mean that we would have to have an 8 to 18% return rate based on our population at any given time. And that's only if we wanted to make some change once a year. And I don't think that's relevant either. So we're shooting for 37% of our monthly population to actually be able to make an actionable item once a month. And now I know that sounds really high, but that's going to be the challenge. We're going to try and work on how do we get better response rates for the surveys that we put out based on a variety of different processes. We were at less than 1% last fall to winter. We're currently sitting, and we have some technical flaws, but we're currently sitting right around 11%. So that's a big gain, but still, again, not where we want to be. Um, so you're saying the candy is paying off. Candy is paying off. <laughs> Um, and then on top of that, our surveys were poorly designed. So when we were reviewed the uh, surveys, it seemed like a lot of them were skewed positively. I mentioned that earlier. I think we had a um, 90 plus percent five score rating on all of our surveys. And it, what it seemed like was happening was individuals that were responding back were only responding to the good experience they had when they had good connections with the agents that they were calling. Um, I'm pretty sure if there was a bad experience, our agents didn't really highlight the surveys that, that came back to them. Um, not only that, the, uh, yeah, pretty much it, they were just skewed and they're poorly designed. So we looked at reinventing the survey along with the process that goes with the survey. Um, on top of that, we were looking at employee sur um, satisfaction. We did nothing at all to measure that. And if you were in a previous uh, talk of our colleagues, they would also mention that the apathy, the poor employee satisfaction was relevant without measurement. And I think that was part of the reason why we didn't measure it back in that time. Just, why measure something that's bad? And that sounds awful, but we, we decided that we definitely want to start measuring our employees because there's downstream effects based on good employee satisfaction as well. So. It created a perfect opportunity, right? We want to talk to the team. Now, that's kind of crazy, too. How many places go out and say, let's talk to the team and see if the team can help us solve the problem? Does that happen at your organization? Yes. Sure, OK. So we set out. We said, the team is hurting because we didn't measure employee satisfaction. There's clearly some deficiencies. How do we start to solve for these? We can sit in the ivory tower and say, here's the great things that we've dreamed up, and surely that'll fix it. Um, or we can go out and engage with the frontline folks and say, you know, you're the one feeling the pain. How do we make this better? So we talked to the team, and we identified some missed opportunities. Probably the biggest one that we found was training. Does that sound familiar to anyone? OK, maybe not. But they wanted training on the current work that was expected to be completed. And that kind of seems a little crazy, too. But we didn't have good knowledge systems. We didn't have good processes there. And so it really was kind of a relatively simple, low-cost thing to fix. We need to, we need to have time to work on things for future growth. 
and we need a training for professional growth. Lastly, the team was really interested in having team building experiences, obviously for trust, camaraderie, and relationship building. You know, last thing we want to do is play tug of war on the team. So a, a couple additional missed opportunities that we identified in this process include time for workplace health. You know, IT, we are bastions of health. And especially in a service desk, right? So we want to find ways to move around, have mental breaks, maybe explore concepts as it relates to nutrition. And they wanted time for project based work assignments. And that's a little different too, because if you're on the phone in a traditional service desk, the last thing you think of is, how do I do project-based work assignments? And then lastly, the team wanted time for process improvement. Now that was interesting. How many people sit around and say, hey, I want to do process improvement? But it was a good thing, and you'll see why. So, can we take a break from tradition? So we begin to focus on a couple of different things. First, quality over quantity. Just because we have more widgets being produced or more widgets measured doesn't necessarily mean that the quality is improved. And in fact, we'd much rather focus on quality. What is your customer experience like, first and foremost, before how many customer experiences do we have? Next, we need to make sure that, in our case, all measurements lead to one of two things. What does customer satisfaction look like? And then what does the sustainability of our team look like? And both are, of course, used to measure the health of the team. So where did we move to, Anurag? So instead of, um, instead of a, a break fix reactive approach, we wanted to look at a foundational approach. Uh, we used our security team, um, or leveraged our security team as well, to influence some of our foundational approaches that we would have better downstream outcomes that we'd um, want. And then we built a continuous improvement cycle into it as well. Um, KPIs, that's what you guys are here for. So I'm going to emphasize something before we move on to actual KPIs, the, the ones that we ended up with. We did a lot of research with our team to figure out what works for us. Um, and that was really important. One of the things that uh, some of our colleagues mentioned in another talk was that we were really interested in our team and how to move our team forward, not individuals. So even though these KPIs that I'll present next can be used individually for individual performance, that is absolutely not what we're doing. We don't want to use it for individual performance. We want to understand what the health of our team looks like and then use process changes to drive different behaviors, not improvement, or sorry, not uh, punitive or um, congratulatory uh, awards for individuals doing something. So we're not looking at quantity anymore, we're looking at quality. So this is a team-based approach. Sometimes some of the metrics are individuals, but they're aggregated to understand what the, the desk is doing. Um, so I am gonna stand behind the podium a little bit so that we can, so I can go through a few of these. Um, there is a paper that we'll link to at the end of this if you guys wanna read it that goes into some more detail. But our two primary KPIs included cost per contact and customer satisfaction. It goes back to the two things that John just mentioned. It's the, um, not just the effectiveness, but the, uh, the, the sustainability of our desk. Money always does something. Resources are allowing us to be sustainable. And then our customer satisfaction, which is the best and almost only indicator of quality for the work that we're doing. Their secondary KPIs that we have support the two previously mentioned ones. So we have agent utilization, first contact resolution rates, and first level resolution rates. This help us, one way or another, either support customer satisfaction, because we get work done quicker at a level that customers are, or are comfortable with, and we're at a more efficient debt, so that we're not using resources where we don't need to. And then our last two are, are balanced KPIs. We put the agent satisfaction as a KPI in the balance, because with happier um, agents, we have better levels of performance in a variety of different areas. Not only just efficiency or a better use of our resources, but happier customers as well. And then we also get it down to lower turnover rates, which is again, wasted resources. Not only for the team, but for our organization. We don't want to have, we understand that churn is gonna be a part of our teams, but we wanna minimize that as much as possible. 
And then an aggregate service desk performance indicator. And what that is is a uh, metric of all of the previous ones that I mentioned, along with um, weighted scores for what we would call our values. And those values and our mission and our strategic plan, as I went forward, would change over time. Values hopefully less often, our strategic plan more often. But that helps us understand how we can modify our overall score to see if we're aligned with our larger organization. <clears throat> um, so, do you want? Yeah. yeah. So the next piece of the puzzle, we built the KPIs. We promised you PPIs in the uh, introduction or on the on the marketing of this. Well, that'll be a future session. So you have to come back next year, and we'll talk to you about PPIs. <laughs> However, we can talk to you about a survey change. So we mentioned earlier the statistical significance on the survey responses that we had was very poor, less than 1%. And so what did we do to try and shore that up, other than the candy concept that I threw out earlier? We shortened it up significantly. So we originally said you had three simple questions to answer. When you walked through it, it turned into six simple questions to answer. And I don't know how simple they were. We consider concepts such as the Net Promoter Score. Has anyone here heard of the Net Promoter Score? OK. So it, it really is a very basic metric. And it goes something like, how likely are you to refer a friend, a colleague, uh, someone you know to use this service or to obtain our help? So one question, uh, a standard Likert scale measurement in the response, we joked internally, it's kind of like that pain scale measurement that we did earlier. Maybe you choose you know, how much of a pain it was to work with us. We kind of joked about it, but the net promoter score is widely used, and so that was one of the things that we looked at. Um, we, of course, applied a, st a statistical approach to the survey redesign that we were doing, because ultimately we're wanting to move the needle, make the information actually usable, as opposed to something that's insignificant. And we reviewed examples of others, other companies, other folks online that we really liked. And so one of the best examples that I liked was Under Armour. So uh, this is back during the holiday time. I'm trying to find a particular uh, color of an Under Armour garment in a particular size. Shopped all around the Kansas City Metro. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Thought I had it. Then they had to uh, turbo ship it in, which really wasn't turbo. It took eight weeks. Uh, missed the holiday. And so I had to call Under Armour directly, and they were able to track one down, send it to me. And then at the end of it, I got this really nice, simple email, basically, tell us how awesome we did. It was really simple. It really kind of got me pepped up and excited to respond to the survey. And so I printed it off, we brought it in, we dissected it, and we used part of that in our process as well. How do we get people excited to reply to a survey? Without kidding. So I'm going to do a little tangent. We mentioned health as part of our desk, and we believe health is also a foundational piece. We did something that was really fun and interesting with our director of our Kermeyer Fitness Center, Amber Long. So she does a lot of health initiatives on our campus, mostly on the university side, but also stemming to the, health, uh, the hospital side as well. She was going to provide us with education and knowledge, and what I was going to help her with was measurement and scalability. What, the, what was awesome about it was with some of our colleagues, we were able to actually measure what our, our help desk was going through. What we designed was three sessions for them to go through different areas just to start getting interested in, the, uh, in health at the workplace. Um, those three areas happened to be nutrition, mental health, and physical health. And we were able to measure some impressive knowledge transfer to those individuals. There was other areas as well, but that was something that allowed us to then take it to the university at large and actually create a scalable um, pilot program. So that pilot program is now going to be used in other departments in the area. We're going to be able to grow our offering for our area. And something that I think one of our colleagues mentioned, which was the next phase, is actually going to be even more expanded. So we wanted to see if we could subsidize 
our um, memberships to the gym at specific time periods in the day so that if um, our help desk individuals wanted to take their lunch at the gym and work out, they could, but what ended up happening was we were able to go to our university leadership and actually just see if there was a model available for everyone on campus to actually just have subsidized or free memberships for the idea of health for everyone. So it was really great in that solving this problem allowed us to scale to solve a larger problem. Um, Jack White. So another component of the puzzle, as we're putting all the puzzle pieces together for the solution that we arrived at, is something that we call the Jayhawk Way. This is a cultural initiative. Um, some people have described it as life coaching on steroids. And we have these reoccurring sessions open to the campus. And they're like an eight-part course that you can go through you know, a few hours at a time. You learn about uh, a variety of different skills, team building, communications. You get to meet with other folks across campus. And it, it really has been an awesome program. And this is something that our uh, vice chancellor for administration has really been passionate about. And we've used this as a platform to plug our service desk staff into. And we've ensured that all of them have had the opportunity to get off the desk and go out and attend those sessions. It gives them the ability to meet with other folks that they're actually helping on a day-to-day -day basis, helps them build some of the skills, the professional and personal development that they desired. And it's a great way, if nothing else, to get off the phone, right? And it was, there was a lot of team-building-based exercises in that program as well. And that was one of the components that we identified early on that we were trying to solve for. And the best part of this, I think, in the feedback that we received from the staff, was they actually appreciate being able to put a face with the names or the voices of the people that they work with. So a lot of times, you know, we just see a name. We just hear a voice. And it becomes easy to kind of think that that's not a person. And this was a way to kind of create that human element and show that the hard work that the team is doing actually translates into something bigger, greater, and better than what you think it is. And especially on those rough days, the days where you're like, you know, it's 4,000 degrees in the office, you know, I'm tired, it's one more problem I have to work on and help someone. And then you go out and you meet that person. Maybe it's a researcher that just made a breakthrough because of the help that you provided to them on that day that you're having a, you know, a tough go at it. And so it becomes even more transformational and it becomes even more powerful. So what, or now what, what next? Um, we're gonna do some refinement of our KPIs. Like we had mentioned, there's a continuous improvement cycle built into all of this. Some of the KPIs we are actually measuring now they need to be refined, and some of them we still need to measure because they're not significant yet. Some of them are very difficult to measure. We still need to figure out what it means to have a happy agent. And we're going to be leveraging our desk to actually do that. What do they believe is happiness? Um, we're also going to be building out our PPIs. Our PPIs we hadn't talked about much, but our PPIs are for individual improvement. But everything that they do for that individual improvement always leads back to the team. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting um, exercise as well. How do we design that correctly so every time they're looking for improvement, they're not only improving themselves, they're improving their team, and they have to help their team out to actually gain that personal improvement. And our SLAs, it's going to be built into our platform that we have, and currently we're okay with not having terrible or terribly defined SLAs, but that's something that we're going to have to work on to help with ma managing our resources over time. Um, I'm going to skip down one, so the balanced scorecard. So it relates back to our KPIs. We're still going to be working on our balanced scorecard. Again, that is important for us to be able to represent what our desk is doing to the leadership and the rest of the university. So we're going to have to take, understand the pulse of what's going on at the university to see what they want to understand from our desk. I don't, I think one of the problems that we had in the past was there were very specific help desk related ticket measurements that we would do that then leadership would see and say, well, you're not doing this well enough. But that wasn't driving the right behavior. So we're going to look at our balanced scorecard as the one that we publicly face that's real time that anyone can look at and say, hey, we are doing better than we were doing before. It's a relative measurement here. 
Um, May I interject for yeah. a second? So even on some of the metrics that we're going to report, we talk about a balanced scorecard. So the ticketing system that we recently moved to is ServiceNow. Uh, we're doing a lot of interesting things in ServiceNow as it relates to dashboards and presenting information, not only so much for the management and the executive leadership perspective, we still are working on the gas gauges for the executive leadership, but as far as our, our staff and the folks on the desk day to day doing work, we've been very passionate about trying to build out the information that they can see in real time. And so as they work on projects, they can see how the KPIs are doing. As we work with them to define exactly how we're going to measure the PPIs, that's going to be the next layer that's added in. They can see on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll be able to see on a trending basis. How are we doing? Are we doing all right? Do we need to make a small course correction because we're starting to trend in a direction that we don't desire? And then long term, we're going to reestablish that um, annual cycle that we see in the academic space about when our true needs are outside of the times that we believe our true needs are. And that's a piece that sometimes I think is a little tricky in higher ed to figure out when we need to have that scalable capacity available. Because we all know at the beginning of a semester, of course, we need scalable capacity. But when you look past that, there's other interesting times. So a lot of us, I think, have already started to recognize, you know, January comes a time when we need some more scalable capacity. Everyone comes back. They have, you know, 27 new iPads in their backpack. And they want the 27 iPads and their laptop and their smartwatch and their smart headphones and their smart Google Glass, whatever's, all to be connected at the same time without a, without a flaw. And so, of course, scalable capacity is good there, too. In, the, in our case, with the way that we do the rotating classes and the way that the, the intervals work for when our different schools start their classes, it makes it more interesting for us to try and figure out when are those peak demand times that we really do need the scalable capacity? And then if you have any remote or satellite locations that you have to staff, that becomes important too to understand that trending. The last bullet on here talks a little bit about leveraging the partnership developed with information security. Now that's probably an odd bullet because most people when we talk about service desk and then information security, we have the information security folks on that side of the room and we have the service desk folks on that side of the room and there's this great divide. What we've really tried to do here is take a novel approach. And we've used the information security team with the service desk team to do a variety of things. So Anurag mentioned the continuous improvement cycle. And one of the things that we focused on here is shoring up process. We've provided lots of additional training to the customer support staff so they understand how does security work in our organization. How can they help? How is it that I, out of thousands of people in the organization, can make a meaningful impact in terms of day-to-day -day security and help our customers understand what that means as well? And they become both the first line and the last line of defense in a lot of ways as it relates to our security program. And then we continue to evolve that. So we run an internship program as well, and we had an intern that oscillated between the two teams, studying problems and pain points, documenting those, improving our knowledge base, helping provide training, and we continue that improvement cycle. In some regards, we look at our service desk as an extension of our information security team. And, in, and I know a lot of our organizations have a situation where you know, funding is always a question, especially where we're all state funded. We often have struggles trying to get more FTEs for the things that we really need to have FTEs behind. And so IT support and specifically security are two areas where those are kind of pain points in most places. And so we said, how do we take what we have and focus on where we want to go and how do we leverage the resources that we have? And so maybe a future talk next year, come back, um, we can talk some more about this this partnership that we've developed and how we started to build this whole ecosystem around it. So John, I have, we have a question actually from the YouTube online. Sure. Um, and wondering if you can get a, an example of the balance scorecard. So as you go through this, I don't know if it's something that could be shown or um, maybe towards the end. So 
just want to interject that and include our online folks as well. Sure. So here's our contact information. I took the slide out that actually had the balanced scorecard uh, example that we were going to use. Uh, if you want to shoot us an email, I'd be happy to send you uh, the example. Um, no problem sharing it. It's something that uh, we took some reference material and we started to work from the reference material and then we've layered in some concepts of our own to make it a little more uh, relevant to our organization. And so just send us an email. We'll send you out a copy of the balanced scorecard that we're looking at and talk to you a little bit more about it. Or if you want to set up a call, uh, we can do that as well. Thanks. So that leads us to more questions. Ah, Perfect timing. Already there. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so questions from the audience here or maybe even online again? I know we've covered a lot of ground. Surely there's some questions. If not, I'm, you're welcome to heckle me. Certainly. So we started a proxy. So the question was, when did we start this process? The teams started to transform probably about 12 months ago. We took on some new leadership. We started to rearrange staffing a little bit. There was a number of months where it was really, let's understand what we have in the team and where we're at. And so there's probably about a four or five month period in which we started discussing with our internal team about the new direction that we want to go. We tried to analyze the skills and capabilities of the team, and then we really started to take action. And so, of course, whenever you take action, sometimes it means some folks agree with the direction you're going, and sometimes they don't agree. And so it also meant that there was an opportunity to bring new staff in during that time for the folks that were like, this is crazy. I, I just don't see that this is going to work. Um, which is ironic because the directive we set for the team was that we want to be crazy amazing. A little less crazy maybe, a little more amazing, but we talk a lot about trying to be crazy amazing. And I think if you look at the team now, if you come up and work with us, if you have an interaction with us, uh, we truly have transformed it such that we are meeting the notions of, of being crazy amazing. One of the side effects, ironically, is uh, quite a bit of food being brought up from our customers to the desk, and I'm afraid it's undermining my weekly workout sessions that I've been doing. Great question. Other questions? Here. I know some people don't want me to throw this thing, so I'll... I was just wondering if you use any kind of framework like ITEL to help you with your metrics. Sorry, repeat that? Did you use any kind of framework like ITEL for your metrics? So the ITIL. Oh, ITIL, sorry. Um, no, so the ITIL is to help us build out certain processes um, to follow, but it isn't something that we are measuring. So the measurement, again, lies along the behaviors that lead towards one of two, um, the two that I mentioned as our primary KPIs. And again, we're not worried about how it gets done, but more so worried about the outcomes. So is it going to help keep our desk sustainable, and is it going to help keep our customers incredibly happy? And that last piece is the most important one, the customer satisfaction it doesn't matter on the back end how the magic happens. It just matters that magic happened, at least in our customers' eyes. And so ITIL, again, is something that we're using to build out some of those processes, and it's not something that our team is only tackling, but other teams as well. But it is, like I guess, a foundational piece that allows us to talk on the same language and allows us to at least be able to communicate. But as far as measurement goes, we're not doing the measurement yet. There may be some relation to the SLAs that we start building out to see if we can better refine and better use our resources, but currently we're not. I call it ITIL-ish. Uh, sometimes more emphasis on the ish than the ITIL part. Um, the, you know, I know a lot of people want to gravitate to ITIL. Um, I think there's a lot of good concepts in ITIL. The challenge I think we have is sometimes, depending upon the size of your organization and the resources you have, it's not always easy to fully adapt and implement everything in ITIL. And that's kind of where we landed. At one point during this transformation, we had four people left 
on our service desk. And at that point, it wasn't so much about ITIL, and it was more about how do we provide the customer experience that we desire. And then as we rebuilt the team, we re-architected, we built the tools around part of the stuff that we were wanting to do, we looked at the measurement, and we continued through continuous process improvement, we found that in most cases, customers desire a positive experience, sometimes more than they desire a resolution to their problem. And that seems a little weird. But I think if you, if you think through that a little bit, it doesn't mean that we can't ever get to the point of fixing their problem because that's not what we desire at all. But we re-architected things such that experience trumped sometimes some of the other formalities that we may otherwise have implemented at the beginning. And I think over time, we're gonna start incorporating more of the ITIL components as we re-architect those processes into ServiceNow. ServiceNow came about the same time that we were re-architecting the team, and so it was, it was a weird transition in the beginning there, and so we're still walking through ITIL and how it aligns throughout the organization, and we inherit those, and as we work on larger IT strategic plans, ITIL keeps coming back in. So it's not that we've wholesale said, ITIL, it's bad, let's throw it in the bottom of the ocean. Um, I just like to joke right now and say it's ITIL-ish. Great question. More questions for this, these presenters? Or any more online? No, okay. Um, let us thank the presenters today and... Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I do want to remind folks here as we finish these sessions, um, if you are going to the KBI uh, reception and piece down there, there will be folks out here by the registration desk to take groups down that way. Um, I haven't checked the weather most recently to see if our walking is still going to be dry on the way, um, but you're, you are welcome to drive around. It is on the south east corner of the campus um, so from here out that direction but there will be people from Washburn taking groups down there so please join us down there as well and then burger stand after that so thank you <laughs>